Welcome everybody to the last meeting of this term. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Darug and Darkinjung people as traditional custodians of the land of Hawkesbury and pay respect to our elders past, present and emerging. I hand over to the general manager now to go through the procedural items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to advise that in accordance with clause 5.18 of the Code of Meeting Practice, meetings of the council are recorded. In the terms of the Privacy and Personal Information Protection Act, this may involve the recording of personal information provided at the time of the meeting. The recordings are made to assist staff in compiling the minutes of the meeting and to enable the podcasting of council meetings. The provision of any information that is recorded is voluntary. If any person does not wish to be recorded, they should not address or request to address the meeting. The recordings may be made available to other persons where such access is in accordance with the relevant regulations. The recordings are stored on council's record management system. For the benefit of those persons who will be addressing the council tonight, it is expected that you will refrain from making any insult, allegation or personal reflection against any person, present or not, at this meeting. This request relates to both your address to councillors, um, to council and in any answers given to questions from councillors. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Uh, do we have any apologies? I think all councillors are here except Councillor Ross. Is that right? Uh, so I think we'll assume he's late. Um, Declarations of interest. Uh, Councillor Reynolds. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to make a special disclosure of pecuniary interest in item 225. 225. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, less than significant non pecuniary interest in item 244. Um, and Councillor Wheeler. Less than significant non pecuniary um, in 233. Okay. Uh, Councillor Richards. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A significant non pecuniary in 245, a significant non pecuniary in 241, a non pecuniary in 244, and a significant non pecuniary in 233. I know way too many people in this area. And Councillor Kotlash. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, items 229 and 242. Uh, significant non pecuniary interest. Thank you. All right, when we get to those items, we'll all read down the tape. Um, you, there's a significant number there, so I'll get you to make sure you jump in at the start if I don't um, refer back to that list and get it right. Um, so we've got uh, some. Actually, first thing we'll do is confirm the minutes. Um, somebody wants to do that. Moved Councillor Garrow, seconded Councillor Rasmussen. In favour, declare that carried. Um, so, councillors, this is obviously the last meeting of the term. Um, and we have a couple of councillors who are not seeking re election, being Councillor Rasmussen and Councillor Tree. Um, so, both have been offered the opportunity to give an address to council. Um, so, I think we'll do that now. I think Councillor Rasmussen indicated he didn't wish to do that, but Councillor Tree, you you wanted to make an address? Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm grateful for my time on council and I've had the opportunity to meet and work with some truly wonderful people. I'd like to thank my Liberal colleagues, Sarah and Pat, for their support over the years and it's been greatly appreciated. I've been fortunate to be on a number of boards and committees over my period on council. And as Vice President of Wesrock, I was part of a two-person delegation who met with the Minister, Warren Truss, to guarantee the um, $18 million of funding for the three intersection upgrades to ensure that it wouldn't be cut. Prior to this meeting, the funding was not a priority for the government. So it was great to see that the tangible difference this has made for the uh, residents in their daily commute. Um, Wesrock also lobbied for the raising of the dam wall as there was great concern about there being a significant flood event. And I think we're only just starting to see those um, occur. We also supported Badgerys Creek Airport, which will bring jobs and infrastructure to Western Sydney. I see these as significant achievements of, in my time on council, but I have to say that the little things like getting a road graded so residents don't lose their tyres and potholes is just as worthwhile. I'd love to give a big uh, shout out to the Sports Council, I was on this committee for a number of years and I observed it as being an excellent delegated authority. The passion and dedication for getting the best outcomes for sporting associations in our community is commendable. 
One of the proudest moments was attending the opening of the nursing home at North Richmond, as it was clear that this was a quality facility which would observe best practice standards for aged care settings, particularly in relation to dementia care. Red Bank is another great outcome for Hawkesbury. It has provided quality housing and created a sense of community for its residents. Many businesses in the local area have enjoyed more turnover as a result, and the public school has grown, uh, which was much needed. Unfortunately, we should have been able to use the Gross River Bridge by now, and I'm saddened by the continual delays which have prevented the builders from getting on with the job. I hope that Council and Transport for New South Wales uh, seek to support the project in a timely manner and that we will see that happen in the coming year because the community expect that. Windsor Bridge is another fabulous outcome for the community as it provides much safer passage for all motorists. Although I have to have a little giggle when detractors lament about how it's not a flood free bridge because I'd like to know where they thought they were going to go once they got to the other side, which is a floodplain and always filled up with water. You would absolutely need a boat. We all do our jobs in different ways. Whilst many like uh, in public life like to enjoy posting to the world about what they have done, what they are doing, about, uh, about what they're about to do to get likes and validation. I personally abhor social media as I see it as a vacuous space and in addition, it can be a very unhealthy platform for keyboard warriors to take pot shots from behind the safety of their screens. There has been a lot of discussion about how unacceptable it is to treat women, women poorly in the political world. I don't think people of any gender deserve to be treated poorly in public life. Much is said about the Me Too movement, workplace bullying and domestic violence, are you okay, links to cyberbullying and suicide and other mental health initiatives. Yet for all this rhetoric, governments continue to turn a blind eye to the incessant online bullying and attacks of public figures. I heard the Minister for Local Government, Shelley Hancock, trying to recruit more women to become councillors. In one breath, she said that it was a great opportunity. And then the next breath, she said you had to grow a thick skin to cope with the cut and thrust of public life. I can tell you from public experience as a counsellor that being on the receiving end of hate mail, emails, texts, phone calls and social media is not fixed by growing a thick skin. It is demoralising, embarrassing, hurtful to your family and totally and utterly not worth the good that you thought you might do once elected. The culture of politics has led to the acceptance or expectation that you'll become the target of vitriol and you just have to cop it as being part of the gig. This attitude enables the well-coordinated army of activists to get away with their hate campaigns as part of the course and without any fear of reprisal. Laws need to be introduced to set a higher expectation about the discourse between elected members and the public. We talk about human rights, dignity, and the right to be safe in the workplace. Yet, and we have anti-bullying laws for the workplace. And yet the public space is an, an elected member's place of work and they are not protected in any way from the abuse of the public. This systemic abuse can lead to poor mental health and should, and should not be expected as being just part of the job. I was glad to see the conversation starting about this idea of workplace safety in federal parliament. And there are many serious incidents that must be investigated. Most likely that we have only seen the tip of the iceberg. I think we can all agree that the culture within the political world needs a seismic shift and that all people should be treated with dignity and respect. However, I am disappointed to see that often the people advocating for the safety of women are the same people who regularly target or support concerted campaigns and attacks on women who do not come from the same ideological camp. These are personal attacks, not attacks on policy. It is slut shaming, commentary about parenting, personal comments about partners, husbands and children. You become complicit when you say nothing to call out the vitriol of trolls on your pages and quietly snigger in the sideline. You are condoning unacceptable behaviour and you are engaging in bullying behaviour. The hypocrisy is galling. I wouldn't have thought that in the year 2021, we still need to remind ourselves that we should be decent human beings to each other, regardless of any background or political leaning. You can always disagree with a political position, but it needs to be done respectfully and not turned into uncontrolled personal attacks. 
On a lighter note, I would particularly like to thank Rob Felch for her ultimate professionalism and support over the last 13 years. I want to wish our new GM the best of luck for the new term and hopefully following terms. I think um, Ms. Uh, Liz Richardson is a breath of fresh air for the council. And from what I can tell, she's doing the job that GM should do and thank thankfully values the notion of good governance. This is where policy and procedures apply to the whole community and the goalposts are the same for all, not shifted to suit political alliances or friendships or lack thereof. Lastly, I'd like to thank and wish all of the council staff and council as well, and hope that the new term brings in some more fresh air and positive changes. Um, Councillor Rasmussen, did you want to say anything? Uh, Mr. Mayor, no, I don't. I'm having a little bit of difficulty with the breathing side of it, but yeah, I, I, um, I mean, basically, it's been a great joy, 23 years, a huge joy to, uh, to serve the, the um, community, the Hawkesbury community. It's a great community, and I wish, uh, I wish my fellow, uh, <clears throat> fellow councillors all the best, particularly the, uh, the progressive ones who continue to move forward and make the Hawkesbury a much, much better place for all of us. And this political game playing uh, has no place in the Hawkesbury. My view, as you all know, political parties are not fit for purpose in the Hawkesbury or any other LGA. We should all work together for common good, do as best we can and go hard. If you don't do that, don't stand for council. And um, thank you. And uh, of course the staff, there have been some really, really good staff over the years. And I do want to thank them for, my, for the support they've given to me. And uh, it's been rewarding, it's been humiliating to, and, and really gratifying to see how, how good people we have in the Hawkesby. They are really good people, they work hard, and the last two years has been particularly hard for them. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and councillors. Thanks, Councillor Rasmussen. I want to thank uh, both Councillor Tree and Councillor Rasmussen, both long-serving councillors who have worked hard over a long time and both certainly will be missed. Um, councillors, we have, uh, as everybody knows, a, an extremely long agenda um, today. Um, and we, as councillors would be aware, the general manager has, has indicated to us a number of items that we have to deal with um, that we do need to be dealt with tonight, um, cannot be adjourned, uh, cannot be cannot be pushed out into a decision. Um, so I'm going to suggest if somebody, that we need to move the order um, of speakers, um, sorry, of business. Um, we also have with us um, visitors from the audit office and um, Grant Thornton just to address us on the financial statements. So if somebody wanted to move, I'm gonna suggest that we deal with item two, three, four, um, then the items on block, then the highlighted items for the councils with that in front of them, which is 224, 229, 244, 245, 246. Um, then go back to um, the agenda for other for the other items that have speakers on them, um, and then deal with the other items in that order that they are in the business paper. Um, just to ensure that we do get um, through um, everything we need to. Councillor Tree, happy to move that. Seconded Councillor Richards. Uh, it's a procedural motion, so all, all those in favour. Clear it carried. Um, and I would just, um, we'll, we'll move into two, two, three, four. I just want to make the comment that um, there is a lot to get through here and most of it, well, all of it um, is very important, but there are some particular items that are you know, quite a lot of substance to them and they, they do, do deserve consideration. Um, so I would really encourage councillors um, that we don't need to have multiple speakers all saying the same thing. We don't need to have three or four speakers in favour of an item if there's no dissent. Um, if everyone can be mindful of the fact that we want to get through this, um, it can mean that we can probably get to all the items. So I just would encourage councillors to keep that in mind. Um, so the first item is 234, um, and our first speaker is Mr. Kenneth Young. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, Mayor and Councillors. So we've um, pre prepared a lovely presentation for Council tonight, and I might just share my screen. Um, so let me know if it works. Yep, we can see that. Lovely. All right, so thank you very much again 
um, for the pleasure to once again present on the conduct of the 2021 audit. Um, we are very, very pleased to announce that the audit of the 30 June 2021 financial statements is complete and we have issued a clean unmodified audit report. So as the year continues to bring us further challenges from the pandemic, it has been really impressive how Council has adjusted to continue to deliver essential services and maintain operations as close to normal as possible. I don't underestimate how challenging this has been and acknowledge how hard it has been for many of your staff. I'm um, in this context, can I please thank you for the way that you've worked to support the audit process? And in particular, doing this against the normal timeframe, despite the impacts of COVID-19 on staff working remotely and in lockdown. Before discussing the conduct of the audit, I'd like to just make some, um, some short general comments. So in 2021, we released our annual work plan, and this work plan explains how we decide what to focus on and what we intend to cover in 2022 for all sectors that we audit. This year's program focuses on government's responses to emergencies. Some of our planned performance audits in 2022 include the COVID-19 Intensive Learning Support Program, Bushfire Recovery Grants, RFS Preparedness, and Virtual Healthcare. Both financial and performance audits will focus on emergency responses to date, and in later years, we'll look at recovery and the impact of government actions. Some of the planned performance audits include the effectiveness of financial management and governance in selected councils, development assessment processes in local councils, coastal management reforms, as well as the effectiveness of local government regulation and support. And of course, our 2022 upcoming financial audit report will include uh, management letter themes, cybersecurity, IT general controls, and as, as well as ARIC and internal audit. So through you, Mayor, I'll probably hand over to James, who will talk on the conduct of the audit itself in detail. Over to you, James. Uh, thank you, Kenneth, and thanks, uh, Mayor and Councillors. Um, again, thanks for the opportunity to just uh, to talk briefly tonight to the conduct of the audit report, um, and 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 just I guess tie that 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 over. Um, I, I guess as Kenneth uh, alluded to, we uh, issued or the audit office issued uh, an unqualified report, um, and, and we're pleased that that was the case. I just sort of talked to a couple of things um, which. I guess really reflect what was in the financial statements for the current year and which we reported on in the conduct of audit report. Um, I guess we noted there the overall, um, from an operational perspective, clearly the impact in the current year of um, the uh, impact of those disposals of assets, which had an impact on the operating bottom line, um, which flipped that around, I guess, um, in, in terms of the operating performance of council in the current year. So that was certainly an, a matter which, which impacted on the financial performance. Um, the... When you, when you look at the financial statements, which we obviously did and, and, and it presented by yourselves and in terms of the operation, the, the, the conduct of water report, which we briefly mentioned, that overall impact of um, the um, of the additional costs, particularly some of those particular, I guess, on the effect of the floods, but also the impact of COVID and, and the general you know, position of councils in the current year um, with some restrictions around revenue meant that there was a, the impact on the operating performance ratio was negative. And so that flipped over again in the current year to, to be um, a, a, a negative ratio. So in terms of the overall ratio performance of council, council met its ratios with the, with the exception of of the operating performance ratio, which uh, you've outlined in your financial statements and the reasons why. And again, I, that's consistent with the operating performance. And then um, not unexpectedly, I suppose, was the, the um, just the, the annual rates and charges outstanding percentages. Um, and, and that's something I guess council continues to keep an eye on. But, but other than those ratios, council met its ratios. Um, in the terms of the overall performance, which we alluded to in the report as well, in terms of cash flow, um, again, cash flow from, from, 
from the operating performance of council was consistent with the prior year. And the overall financial position, therefore, of council was um, um, particularly, I guess, um, presented in, in that cash flow where that, that the consistency of cash flow from the prior year meant that you, you're achieving a cash surplus, which then is deployed into the infrastructure assets of council. Um, so I guess in, in that sense, um, we, you know, we pointed to those the operating performance, we've pointed to the compliance with those with, with most of the ratios and, and councillors has also mentioned that in, in his financial statements. Um, any other, there was no other additional matters really to note. The, the, uh, there was nothing from a, from a legislative compliance perspective. Um, so again, the, in, in terms of the outcome for the year, it was obviously significantly affected by the uh, the impact of the floods and uh, which had an impact on both uh, an impairment and a disposal, which, which, uh, which affected a financial outcome come in terms of the presentation of the financial statements. But um, uh, I guess I'm happy to pause there and we and, and, uh, and, and hand back to you, Kenneth. Thanks, James. Um, I think that's all we, we had. I'm happy to take any questions or anything. Great, thank you. Um, do you mind just pulling down the presentation so I can see the gallery view? Um, Councillors, are there any questions? No, thank you for that. Thanks so much for your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank um, you, Mayor. In that case, is somebody a deputy member with the recommendation? Yep, seconder for that, Councillor Wheeler. There is, a, oh, sorry, I meant to mention there's a slightly updated staff recommendation um, to this one. It's just to include the fact that we want in point two that we've had representatives from both the audit office and Grant Thornton. Um, so I don't know if we want to bring that up on the screen if possible. It's a very minor change. Just to point two. Yeah. Any discussion on this item, councillors? If not, I'll put the motion. Um, sorry if you don't mind taking it. Yep, thank you. Uh, everyone in favour, please raise your hand. Favour of Councillor Connolly, Councillor Lance Bucket, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Kotlash, Councillor Garrow, Councillor Richards, Councillor Zimprogno, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Rasmussen, Councillor Tree. Against, Councillor Ross, declare it carried. So next with the items on block, Somebody wanted to move those. Move to Councillor Gary, seconded Councillor Richards. I have any interest. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank Good you. job. <laughs> read your interest out, please. Uh, thank you. It's for item 241. Sorry, we've got to flick screens. Um, local Traffic Committee, my partner's business is in the area, so I'll be declaring a significant non pecuniary interest and leaving the vote, please. Okay. So wait for you to go to the waiting room. Okay, um, all right, we'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Favour of Councillor Connolly, Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Carver, Councillor Cotlash, Councillor Gary, Councillor Zemprogno, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Rasmussen, Councillor Tree. I just realised I don't have a seconder because I didn't read that out correctly. Councillor Tree, happy to second that. Declare that carried and we'll let uh, Councillor Richards back in. Okay, um, next item is 224. Uh, which we have two speakers. Uh, first speaker is Mr. Glenn Apps. Just let them um, move the speakers into the room. Okay, Mr. Apps, we just got onto item 224 and we're up to your address if you're ready. Uh, hello, councillors, can you see me and hear me? I uh, can hear you, yep. Right. Yes, there you are, yep, um, I can see you, sorry. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the proponent and in support of the recommendation, and as a result, I'm, you have the benefit of me being mercifully brief. Uh, the recommendation is that Council support the planning proposal, and obviously we endorse that recommendation. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Council staff for their considered assessment of the, of the application. It has been a long process and the planning proposal has evolved over time to where it is tonight in response to various strategies that have been implemented since the planning proposal was lodged. And again, we thank council staff for their assistance over the protracted course of this matter. And we're pleased that we are here tonight with a recommendation of support. So other than commend the recommendation of the report to you, I have nothing further to say, uh, other than to respond to any questions that uh, councillors may have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, councillors? No? 
Okay, thank you. And then our second speaker is Mr. Michael Want. You ready, Mr. Want? Yes, yes. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, uh, Mayor. The NRDC AA continues its opposition to no rezoning of land west of the river until the infrastructure is in place to ease traffic congestion. In addition, Dr. Sebastian Forch, senior lecturer in urban studies at Western Sydney's University, said single standing dwellings are the Australian nightmare when it comes to heat. It probably also is a nightmare when it comes to public health or even the social interaction between the people because they are just inside because it is too, just too hot outside. He said, we are creating a very, very dire situation out here. And he told the cooling the cities he told the cooling cities uh, hosted by Penrith City Council in 220. The heat crisis in Western Sydney is posing a serious risk to people's health. It's in your hands, councillors, if you can change the trajectory in which we are heading. The community cannot rely on governments who say around election time, we will build car parks, build shooting ranges in regional towns, a bridge across the Hawkesbury River in 2027 plus, or the Gross River Bridge that was promised over 10 years ago. The Gross River Bridge should never be built. Our environment is more important than a five tonne load limit crossing to cross the Gross River. If council and the government are fair income, they would build the bridge across the Hawkesbury to join Crowley's Lane and then the Driftway. The business paper at page 21 refers to a city supported by infrastructure in accordance with the three city plan. The Western Sydney District Plan has been considered and issues addressed, all getting the big tick from council staff. At page 40 of the business paper, Transport for New South Wales raises matters in relation to traffic, to first year traffic cumulative impacts. Council traffic studies pursued and obtained by the progressive councillors say there will be no significant impact. As I said earlier, we should not rely on hope that bridges will be built, we should wait till the bridges are built. That is what, what the over 4,400 petitioners have been asked to sign the petition, no resigning, with, no resigning of land west of the river till the infrastructure is in place. There are four submissions attached to the report. As I read them, none of them are in support. One says if residents don't put their foot down now, the Kermont and Karajong may well be called Richmond too. Council, at least there is a reduction in the number of lots from 30 to 11. The progressive councillors receive another tick for that reduction. The rural landscapes between Kylo High on Bell's Line of Road and Commonroy Road where once farms existed, including four dairy farms, will be gone. The city slickers will have to drive further to fill the country experience. Despite claims made by some, the planning proposals in the pipeline will complete the demolition of our rural landscapes in that area, unless a majority of progressive councillors are elected in December. So councillors, if you are inclined to be wavering, then refer the planning proposals to the next, count, to the next council. Now, Mr. Chair, the President of the NRDC, sorry, Mr. Mayor, the President of the NRDC AA Beatrice in Susie has asked me to publicly, publicly thank the Progressive Councillor Paul Rasmussen for his 20 years service as a servant of the people of the Hawkesbury local government area. Uh, she's asked, said that Paul has engaged with the community and community groups, listened to their concerns, represented those concerns within the chamber and through popular channels within the council. He led the farming community for years. He may well still be involved. His service was state five star and still is. His commitment was unwavering despite his ill health. The NRDC AA would love to see at least seven Paul Rasmussen after the December elections. He was a councillor who ticked the eight boxes identified. He ticked every box identified in the role of a councillor under the Local Government Act. And I just refer to two of those, uh, Mr. Mayor. A D, to represent the collective interests of residents, ratepayers and local community, Paul was outstanding. B, to facilitate communications between the local community and the governing body, again outstanding. I would urge, I would urge, I would urge those councillors who are elected in December to follow Paul's example. Thanks, Paul, from our president and the executive members of the NRDC AA. You were there when the community needed you regardless. Thank you. Mr. Want, are you happy to take questions if councillors have questions? Yes, sir. Are there any questions for Mr. Want? No? Okay, thank you. Um, so councillors, uh, items open for discussion if someone wants to move something.
So make sure you use your small hands, the, the zoom hands, because I can't see everyone on one screen at the moment. So. Nobody wants to move anything? That's my call, Ash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll move the recommendation in the business paper. Seconder for that. Councillor Tree, thank you. Any discussion? No, we'll put the motion then. All those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand. Favour are Councillor Kotlash, Councillor Connolly, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Zamprogno, Councillor Tree, Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Richards. Against? Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Garrow, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Ross, uh, Councillor Rasmussen, declare it carried. Um, the next item is, sorry, councillors, um, 229, the Warragamba Dam submission. Um, right? yep. Mr Mayor, um, I have uh, an interest in that. Yep, can I read that on the tape, please? Uh, uh, I am a member of the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area Advisory Committee. This committee has recently been briefed on the EIS and of this project, and while the committee has yet to meet formally, the level of opposition to the project has become clear. I therefore feel that it is inappropriate for me to be involved in deliberations on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wait till Councillor Colash is in the waiting room. Um, okay, anybody wish to move anything on item 229? Recommendation, Councillor Wheeler. Yeah, seconded uh, Councillor Lyons Bucket. Any discussion? No, all right, we'll put the motion. Um, oh, Deputy Mayor, did you want to say something? Yes, please, Mr. Mayor. I've actually got a hard copy of the business paper and I'm having, I'm not used to it, I'm used to my iPad and I'm trying to find it. Um, I did just want to draw, thank the staff for doing the submission and just draw attention uh, to the public, uh, to some public, the public, to some facts that are in the business paper. And I think it would be really good um, if, if people read that to see the history around the dam, because there's some things being said out there in the public in, in sort of election mode that aren't entirely uh, true. And I think it would be good if the public were to read um, about uh, what has transpired to get to this point. I know we're speaking about the submission, but I note that the history is quite well documented in there, in particular um, that uh, this is back from the 60s and so on. And I'd just like to say that obviously there's issues with turning a water storage dam into a flood mitigation dam, and hence it has never been done in the last 50 or so years. And I think that we've raised things in our submission that get to the core of uh, the core reasons of um, what should be being looked at in an EIS and that we, um, you know, that we have put together something that really calls for transparency in on this matter when it's such a big project and when council has repeatedly asked for this information. I think that uh, it's, it's a submission uh, over the last 50 or so years the government has not taken any notice of what council's opinion was because they have not done what uh, council's opinion was. And so I think that it will be really interesting to get the responses or to see if there are any responses to what's been raised in, the, in, in response to the omissions in the EIS. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Um, all right, we'll, um, we'll put the motion then. Um, Councillor Zamprong, do you have, you've got the ability to raise your hand on Zoom? Yep, so I'll get you from now on, um, Councillor, this is the last time I'll allow that. If you want to speak on the item, put your hand up on Zoom. And if I've called the demo speakers, we're moving on. Um, we're not gonna all wait to try and be the last one to speak, or might. Uh, Councillor Zamprong, now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, it's not my intention to rehash what are well-established and well-entrenched positions on this, but fundamentally uh, endorsing this submission should not be taken as uh, by any other political uh, actors as um, Hawkesbury Council declaring that there should be no raising of Warragamba Dam. This submission is about raising issues that we see as gaps, raising issues that are particularly germane to our community. And 
um, I've taken the view that a bad submission is better than no submission. This submission has many flaws in terms of the tone that it takes, but I just want to put on the public record that uh, we would be abrogating our duty if we did nothing. And if this is the only thing that the chamber will endorse, then I will accept it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, right of reply, Councillor Wheeler. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just very briefly, um, just to um, to the to the point uh, that this is a that there are flaws with this submission. I don't think this is a bad submission. I think this is I think this is the possible submission from this current council. Uh, I think it's actually um, much of it is much of it makes some, some excellent points about what we see as the the the, the gaps um, in this process and certainly the gaps in the information that have been given to us. Uh, we are, we've been briefed by Infrastructure New South Wales. We, the additional information that we've gleaned has been from the Upper House Inquiry and, and experts um, who have addressed that inquiry. None of those experts have addressed this council. Uh, none of them have been made available to us for questioning. We are dealing with the information that is before us. Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad that council is making a submission. Um, and I'm glad that council is making a submission that discusses the information relevant to the Hawkesbury, uh, not to other areas um, and, and a submission that has um, a notable absence of fear mongering and, um, and cries of, um, of um, drowning people or not caring about the residents. It's worth noting, um, given that many people are using this as an election issue, that council is not in a position to give this project the go ahead. Anybody who claims that they um, are, are capable of raising the wall for flood mitigation is simply lying to the people who might vote for them on that basis. Thank you. Uh, we'll put the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand. In favour of Councillors and Progno, Councillor Lance Bucket, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Gary, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Rasmussen, Councillor Ross, Councillor Reynolds. Against? Councillor Connolly, Councillor Tree, Councillor Richards. Declare it carried. Um, next item, therefore, is item 244, which is in confidential. So does someone want to move we go into confidential? Move to Councillor Garrow. Uh, seconded Councillor Rasmussen. All in favour? Declare that carried. So we'll, we'll, we'll go into confidential and we'll return afterwards to deal with the remainder. Okay, now, now back in uh, open session, let's hand over to the General Manager to advise of Council's resolutions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, whilst in a confidential session, Council dealt with three items. Item 244, nominations for 2022 Australia Day Awards. Item 245, appointment to the Hawkesbury Local Planning Panel. And item 246, legal advice in respect of development application 0508 of 2018, Extractive Industries at 374, 395 and 415 Freeman's Reach Road, Freeman's Reach. So first of all, um, a procedural motion was moved by Councillor Lyons Bucket, seconded by Councillor Garrow, um, that consideration of each award category be dealt with in seriatim. So that's in respect of item 244, nominations for the Australia Day Awards. Um, so in respect of motion one, um, Councillor Lyons Bucket and Councillor Richards um, declared interest and I will um, pass over to those councillors to make those declarations. Thank you, um, Ms Richardson. Uh, I have in item 244, a less than significant non-pecuniary interest and uh, we will withdraw from voting in the relevant categories. Thank you. Uh, thank you. In item 244, I also had a less than significant non-pecuniary interest and I withdrew from voting on those relevant categories as well. 
thank you. So uh, whilst in closed session, the council resol resolved on the motion of Councillor Wheeler, seconded by Councillor Kotlash, that council adopt the confidential recommendation developed in closed session of council in regard to the recipient of the 2022 Citizen of the Year Award. Uh, for the motion were councillors Connolly, Calvert, Garrow, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Ross, Tree, Wheeler and Zamponio against the motion and no councillors and absent for the vote were councillor councillors Lyons, Bucket, Cotlash and Richards. Um, in respect of motion two, um, councillor Lyons, Bucket and councillor Richards um, made the same declarations as they did with respect to motion one. I think that's fair councillors. Um, and that council uh, resolved on the motion of Councillor Ross, seconded by Councillor Garrow, that Council adopts the confidential recommendation developed in closed session in regard to the recipient of the 2022 Young Citizen of the Year Award. Uh, for the motion were Councillors Connolly, Calvert, Garrow, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Ross, Tree, Wheeler and Zampronio. There were no councillors against the motion and absent for the vote were Councillors Lyons, Bucket, Cotlash and Richards. Uh, motion three, um, in respect um, of motion three, council resolved on the motion of Councillor Wheeler, seconded by Councillor Garrow, that council adopt the confidential recommendation developed in closed session in regard to the recipient of the 2022 Volunteer of the Year Award. For the motion were councillors Connolly, Calvert, Garrow, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Ross, Tree, Wheeler, Zampronio. There were no councillors against the motion and absent for the vote were councillors Lyons, Bucket, Cotlash and Richards. With respect to motion four, uh, councillors resolved on the motion of Councillor Lyons Bucket um, and seconded by Councillor Garrow, that council adopt the confidential recommendation developed in closed session in respect to the recipient of the 2022 Local Hero Award. For the motion were councillors Connolly, Lyons Bucket, Calvert, Cotlash, Garrow, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Richards, Ross, Tree, Wheeler and Zampronio. Uh, no councillors were against the motion and all councillors were present. Motion five, uh, whilst in closed session, the council resolved on the motion of Councillor Garrow, seconded by Councillor Reynolds, the council adopt the confidential recommendation developed in closed session of the council uh, in regard to the recipient of the 2022 Community Organisation of the Year Award. For the motion were councillors Connolly, Lyons, Bucket, Calvert, Garrow, Cotlash, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Richards, Ross, Tree, Wheeler and Zampronio. Uh, there were no councillors against the motion and there were no councillors absent. Respect of item six, um, whilst in closed session, the council resolved on the motion of Councillor Reynolds, seconded by Councillor Ross. The council adopts the confidential recommendation developed in closed session of council in regard to the recipient of the 2022 Community Arts Award. For the motion were councillors Connolly, Lyons, Bucket, Calvert, Garrow, Cotlash, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Richards, Ross, Tree, Wheeler, Zampronio. There were no councillors against the motion and no councillors were absent. In respect of uh, motion seven, uh, Councillor Richards um, declared an interest in respect of this matter, uh, the same declaration of interest that um, she declared in respect of motion number one. Um, and whilst in closed session, the council resolved on the motion of Councillor Reynolds, seconded by Councillor Wheeler. The council adopt the confidential recommendation developed in closed session of the council in regard to the 2000 recipient of the 2022 Junior Sports Person of the Year Award. For the motion were councillors Connolly, Calvert, Garrow, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Ross, Tree, Wheeler, Zampronio. Against the motion were no councillors. Absent for the vote uh, were councillors Lyons, Bucket, Cotlash and Richards. Uh, and lastly, um, motion eight, um, whilst in closed session, the council resolved on the motion of Councillor Garrow, seconded by Councillor Reynolds. Uh, the council adopt the confidential recommendation developed in closed session uh, of council in regard to the recipient of the 2022 Person of the Year Award. For the motion were Councillors Connolly, Lyons, Bucket, Calvert, Garrow, Cotlash, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Richards, Ross, Tree, Willa, Zampronio. Against the motion um, were no councillors and, and absent for the vote um, were no councillors. In respect of item 245, appointments to the Hawkesbury Local Planning Panel, uh, the Council resolved on the motion of Councillor Lyons Bucket, seconded by Councillor Wheeler, that uh, Council select the following two community representatives from the pool of community members of the Hawkesbury Local Planning Panel for the meetings of the Local Planning Panel meeting until the 31st of September, 2021, um, Paul Rogers and Graham Eds. A report be provided to the first council meeting of the new council term in relation to the role of community representatives and to select any additional community representatives. 
Point three, advise the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment of the community representatives appointed by Council to the Hawkesbury Local Planning Panel. Four, advise all applicants of Council's determination and thank them for their interest in this matter. For the motion were councillors Lyons, Bucket, Garrow, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Ross, Wheeler and Zampronio. Against the motion were councillors Connolly, Calvert, Tree and Kotlash. And absent for the vote was councillor Richards. Just thinking if councillor Richards have a Can I please declare yes. my interest? Thank you, general manager. Um, in item number 245, I declared a significant non-pecuniary interest. One nominee works with was working with my partner, another is a member of my Rotary Club, and I left the room for the vote. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and the last motion considered uh, in confidential session was in respect of uh, legal advice um, in regard to a development application on Freeman's Reach Road, Freeman's Reach. Whilst in closed session, the Council resolved on the motion of Councillor Cotlash, seconded by Councillor Tree. Uh, that uh, the council one note the report regarding the legal advice obtained in regards to the means to lodge an appeal against the approval of development application DA 05008 of 2018 granted by the Sydney Western City Planning Panel at 374 395 and 415 Freeman's Reach Road Freeman's Reach on the 14th of September 2021 and point two not proceed with uh, and appeal not not proceed to appeal the decision um, granted by the Sydney Western City Planning Panel. For the motion were councillors Connolly, Calvert, Lyons, Bucket, Garrow, Cotlash, Rasmussen, Reynolds, Richards, Ross, Tree, Wheeler and Zampronio. Uh, against the motion um, were no councillors and um, all councillors were present for the vote. Um, I think that's it, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Okay, so we move on to item uh, items now uh, on agenda with speakers. Um, so the first item therefore is 226. Um, and our one speaker, Matilda Julian, just get her into the meeting. Just for a moment to connect. Hi, Matilda, we've just gotten up to item 226 and you're our uh, only speaker on the item. So uh, when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this time to address okay. council. I know that it's a busy meeting. Hi, Matilda, we've just gotten up ah. to item 226 and you're our uh, only speaker on the item. So uh, when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this time to address okay. council. I know that Hi Matilda, we've just gotten up ah. to item 226 and you're our uh, only speaker on the item. So <laughs> love where this um, happens. Ready. Um, do we have item 226 and you're our uh, only speaker on the item? So love where this happens. Ready. Um, do we have seven second delay problem? Um, now I'm not watching say anything else, but this is um, so meta. needs to be dimension here. Anybody got it? Does anybody have YouTube open? If you've got YouTube open, we need to, we need to close that. So needs to be dimension here. Matilda, you don't have YouTube open? Uh, maybe that's it. Anybody got it? Does anybody have YouTube open? If you've got YouTube open, we need to. Okay, potentially that fixed the problem. I think. Um, when you're ready, Matilda, try again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for listening to me again. Um, I've had a chance to look at the first section of the proposed DCP. I've also had a good working knowledge of the old document. My concern is that there have been no changes to the way that car parking will be assessed for the new agritourism sections. For reference, they are on pages 77 and, 70, and 79 of the proposed document. 
Given that this is the first time a DCP has been reviewed in 18 years, the community would expect that council take the care and attention to get it right so that it fits for the future and the current culture of the Hawkesbury. Therefore, care should be taken to adequately reflect changes that have happened and are happening in agritourism in our area. We've all seen agri agriculture change in the last, say, 10 years. I grew up in and live in Philpin, and so I've seen this firsthand. Agriculture land use conflict is also changing. Agriculture used to mean smells, sprays and sounds. Now it means tourists, traffic and hazards. The DCP should reflect these changes. Car parking may not seem like a major issue, but the way agritourism is currently being assessed and will continue to be assessed if no changes are made to the new DCP is that local streets and main roads are becoming private business car parks for hundreds of people and it's becoming unsafe. For example, Hillbilly Cider Cellar Door was assessed as a roadside stall with a cafe and restaurant. Therefore, when it was assessed, it required five car spots for the roadside stall and the cafe gross floor area ratio was used to determine that 15 car spaces in total was sufficient. The outdoor picnic areas weren't taken into account and the tourist nature of the operation was not taken into account. As a result, the overflow of cars ends up on a narrow rural road causing hazards for other road users. The same is happening throughout the Hawkesbury. It's happening at Bilpin Cider Cellar Door and most people listening tonight would have probably heard of or seen the hazards around the Kermon Picker and Flower Farm. This type of activity, as in agritourism, is only expected to increase across the Hawkesbury, which means that the DCP should respond to these cultural changes and reflect them. I'm not advocating for anything revolutionary. I'm simply suggesting that council give this issue some due consideration and do some pro problem solving rather than ignoring the issue because there's no precedent elsewhere or it presents a challenge. It may simply mean that outdoor eating, for example, or farm gate developments attract some kind of outdoor recreational or eating gross floor area ratio. For example, a pick your own property's car parking space could be based on how many hectares of usable farm area there is. I would just like to add as a final note that some may be thinking that such a comment as mine is better heard in the public exhibition period. Unfortunately, I've seen too many times the heartfelt submissions by residents being ignored in that space. And so I believe that people should be given a voice at the beginning of planning not the end when the decision has largely been made. Therefore, I'm asking council to consider this issue before agreeing to put this document on public exhibition. Thank you for your time and for listening to me. Thank you. Are you happy to take questions from councillors if any councillors have any? Sure. Councillor Reynolds, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, thanks, Ms. Julian, for um, speaking to us tonight. Which, which roads in particular um, are causing a problem? Is it Bell's line of road or is it, for example, Kurtz road or, I mean, parking uh, wise, which, which roads are causing yeah, the sure. issue in, in your, in your view? Um, I would say in the Bilpin area, it's definitely Kurtz road. Uh, people are parking on the road because there's no verge. It's such a narrow road and there's no space off the road. And mm -hmm. also Johnson's road, which Johnson's is where the road. overflow from Hillbilly Spider is is parked. Okay, so um, parking on Bell's line of road um, isn't uh, a particular issue at all? It's definitely ish an issue in autumn. Um, you'll see that cars are parked, say, outside the Botanic Gardens, um, on the main road. Um, also, when some of the pick-your-own places are um, in operation, yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah, thanks It's for also that. because it's a... Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Thank Deputy you. Mayor. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Matilda. Um, I'm just wondering, and I know, and thank you for raising the issues that you've raised both tonight and previously when you've put in a submission around this. Um, I understand, you know, your desire to have it included. I'm just wondering, uh, will you still put in a public exhibition, uh, a public exhibition, a submission uh, during the public exhibition phase if this goes out tonight? Or is your request uh, some sort of a delay in having it go on public exhibition? I didn't quite get what exactly it was that you were um, asking of the councillors. Uh, you asked us to consider it, which uh, I'm happy to do, but um, can you just clarify that, please? Yeah, sure. I'm, uh, I, I suppose I'm asking for um, some further consideration to go into um, uh, problem solving um, around this issue. I, I believe that it's been left out of the review of the DCP and I believe that's because it presents a challenge and so I suppose it, it requires some more attention. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks. Councillor Reynolds, did you have your hand up again or it's just still? Yeah. Um, can I go sort of outside the process a tiny bit and start by asking a question? Um, just whether the um, director, city planning or manager of strategic planning wanted to comment um, on, on that address and, and whether those things have been left out or plan to be addressed some other way. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so in, in stage of this, we are um, looking to do some more detailed um, place planning work, particularly in the area of Bilkin, and I've met with Matilda and some other members of that community to discuss that process and timing because we're looking to start that early in 2022 and that work will inform both um, further work around the LEP and obviously the DCP. Um, I would, I, I, I do understand and I'm aware of the concerns that have been raised by Matilda and others in that area. Um, my, what, what I'd be hoping to see though that we can proceed with stage one of this work as it, it really would support the assessment of you know planning um, decisions on a range of, of other matters. Uh, it, it doesn't mean we can't come back and revisit this and modify that chapter um, in the next stage. It just means that I, you know, essentially the rest of the work here would also be very useful in terms of our planning work. Thank you. Councillor Wheeler. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I want to move the recommendation in the business paper. Is there a seconder for that? Seconded, Councillor Reynolds, sorry. Yep. Uh, thanks, Ella. Thanks, look, I've got, um, I've got a few problems with, with parking in here as well. I'm hoping that, um, that the staff can, can make some revision to some of the, the, the parking recommendations that are, that are in here, and perhaps we need an additional category um, for um, agritourism and its, and its parking, uh, because it, it sits in a different space, I think, than much of our business parking in that it usually occurs, certainly here, it occurs in very long strips um, of, of road and one, one business, you don't share the parking between a number of businesses. You know, there's that little patch of Bilpin where, I, where you may share a bit of parking, for example, with... Um, the Apple Bar and Grumpy Baker across the road. But for most of Bilpin, like Hillbilly Cider, for example, um, you know, or even our own facility at the community centre, they're distinct entities and the distance between them is such that no one walks. So everybody needs a car space every time they stop um, and they stop multiple times. And so where we might have a business, a main street business in one of our towns where they're more densely settled or, or the businesses are more, are more densely settled, you can, you can have a car park that where someone will stop and they'll go to, to perhaps two or three businesses. So each business doesn't need the same number of car spaces. What we know from Bilpin in particular, um, and I think it's been very well articulated this evening, is that we get we get people who, and who park and then do one business, get in the car, drive to the next one. And they're, they're often... The, they're excited, they're focused on what they're doing, they're focused on getting something to eat or, or going into a business. They're not at all, they're not at all focused on the hazard that they're causing for everybody else. So I think perhaps we need to look at this as an additional um, 
table and I'd be happy if we need to put that in as a specific resolution um, that we have um, an additional section for, for parking recommendations for agritourism uh, businesses. I think we're probably treating them like a food and drinks premises at the moment and that isn't working in, in some of the spaces where we've got them. Um, I think we've actually, and that, so I think we've got, not got enough parking spaces for some of them, uh, but then in some of these other spaces, we've got too many um, car, too many car parking spaces. And I um, refer particularly to the top of that, that, ta that parking table where we've got um, dwelling houses, um, where we've got one covered par car parking space um, and for um, up to a two bedroom dwelling and two covered car spaces for dwellings with more than two bedrooms. I think that's overkill. I don't think that people should have to provide a roof for two cars if they've got a three bedroom house, for example. Um, many people don't want two cars. Many people would prefer to keep their car parked in the driveway. Uh, I think we're, I think we, we need to think about the the cost that we push up for each residential dwelling if we make those demands. Um, so I'm not I'm I'm not comfortable with the parking rates as they stand, but I'm hoping that this, that this comes back to council following um, the, the submission phase. I'm I'm pushing for this to go um, out to, to public exhibition because we've done an ex we as a council and the staff in particular have done a lot of work. Uh, in this in this space and and much of that work has been excellent we came into council calling for place-based planning for proactive planning where we determine what developments are appropriate for the Hawkesbury um, as representatives of the the people who live here the our current DCP is old it's not fit for purpose frankly it's been a bit of a joke for far too long it doesn't stand up in the environment, land and environment court, uh, because we have haven't stuck to it either. Um, this is a detailed, forward-looking piece of work that sets us up for a future where the climate is hotter and less stable. It seeks to empower applicants to use resources better and to build better homes and neighbourhoods. Used well, it should assist not only new builders and renovators to provide better spaces, but also to protect existing residents and their quality of life in the environment. Um, I want to thank the staff for including us in this process. It's been really interesting um, and it's been really nice to work with my fellow councillors with our differences of opinion and experience where we've looked at all of these, um, these the different things that have made up both the DCP and the LEP. And I think we've had a fairly robust and useful exchange of views. Um, I also want to thank the industry reps that have been involved for their input. Um, and particularly the staff for setting up this time consuming um, but really innovative process, I think, which has led to a far more consensus based document. Thanks. Thank you. So I've had one speaker in favour. Is there anyone wishing to speak against? There's no one wishing to speak against. Do we need further speakers in favour? Councillor Reynolds. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, I think Matilda raises some valid points and it's interesting that when we speak of tourism, we, we know we know that a lot of people, the tourists to the area, especially up around Bilton, come from Sydney. And um, from my experience in um, Sydney, especially in the inner west, um, people are used to high density parking, I suppose you could call it, and live in places where parking is at a premium. Um, you know, you drive around the inner west and um, it's very difficult for cars to, to, to pass on, on any non-major road. Um, I, think, I think the issues that Matilda raised are exactly the sort of response that we need from public consultation. Um, this, this, is, this is why we go to public consultation, so that these sort of issues are raised. I think ad addressing this one issue, like put, put, putting the the um, public consultation off to deal with this particular issue, um, is uh, it's not the way to go. I think that it needs to go out, and then all the issues raised come back, and then staff and um, councillors then uh, deal with them. I mean, parking issues are similar to traffic. We're not used to lots and lots of traffic, like high density, extreme traffic, like in Sydney out here in some places. Um, and so, you know, the parking issues associated with that are something that we're not used to. 
Um, so I support the motion as it is, and I just want to thank Matilda again for raising the issue, and I hope she does make a submission um, should this uh, go through. Thank you. Thanks. So we've had two speakers in favour. Are there any speakers against? No speakers against the motion. I'm just, I'd just remind councils we have a very long agenda, and if we all agree with each other, we probably don't need to sit around saying it if we're all going to have the same resolution, but everyone's got a right to speak, so I won't stop anyone. So, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And I, do, I will just take a little bit of a different tack, so I'm not just repeating what's been said. And I'd like to thank Matilda for bringing those points. Um, I think that uh, I just wanted to clarify, had the extra uh, thing been included in the motion? Is that part of the motion to include the um, a specific section on the agritourism part? The motion, the motion before us is the recommendation of the business paper. Okay. So we're just hoping that staff will take that on board and do that. Um, I probably would have liked to see it included, but if it's not there, um, I think that uh, I, I think that Matilda has raised something that's really important that we need to get the public involved at the start of these processes because now it goes to public exhibition. If it goes at public exhibition, it's going to be over Christmas time. It's towards the end of the year when everyone's busy. And then we have people who will feel that that's unfair because uh, of the timing of the year and so on. I think that if we have interested public uh, uh, members who want to submit things, that we should have some sort of a facility for them to do that right back at the start because then we could have these things in included for them to go out on public exhibition rather than waiting until they go on public exhibition and we get all sorts of different feedback and then we have to sort of try and decide where that all fits in. Um, obviously, we wouldn't incorporate what everyone says, but things around experience of the evolving controls that we need, and I think this is at the key of to it, is that we are now living in an area that's undergoing land use change. We're having different influxes of people for different reasons. And I think our DCP has to be a current, it has to keep up with current trends. We're updating a very old DCP to try and make it, um, you know, current. And yet we want to make sure that it really is current. So I'm hoping Matilda will put all her thoughts again into another submission and that other people will do the same. This is what we need to hear. And I would also like to thank the staff as one of the councillors who's engaged in all the DCP sessions. It's been really, really valuable to be a part of it. And uh, a lot of work's been done. And I do endorse it going out as soon as possible on public exhibition. But I hope that in the future, the uh, level of engagement with the public around these uh, particularly large reviews of documents will incorporate some mechanism for members of the public to feed into it before that final stage of public exhibition. I think that's very important and I welcome that and I thank the people that do that regularly from our community. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're all in favour based on that. So we'll go right of apply, Councillor Wheeler, if required. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just quickly um, wanna, wanted to ask um, the Director of Planning uh, a question, if possible. Uh, okay. Yeah, I did go right over live, but we'll do that first quickly, yep. Um, so it's just um, the, in, in the um, business paper, it refers to a proposed agritourism set. Is it possible that these planning um, matters will be covered by that? that sorry, these parking matters? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. At this stage, um, we're not quite sure what the set will cover, um, but we're into, I mean, ultimately we will need to see what it does cover and how it will affect us at the local level and how we need to respond. But at the moment, we're not sure exactly when this will come out. We, we just know it's been alluded to, um, and then we'll see where that leaves us in both in terms of the LEP and obviously the development control plan. Thanks. Um, and just a supplementary question then. Um, I assume that the um, strategic planning staff have, have taken down the concerns that have been raised about parking. Uh, yes, we have. Thank you. Uh, look, very quick right of reply then, Mr Mayor. This is, I think this, it's important to, to make sure that everyone is aware that this is the next phase of the, of this, of the evolution of this document. Um, you know, first the staff wrote us a sample document and then both um, industry experts and councillors discussed what we wanted um, this, you know, this document to look like based on that initial draft. We made a lot of changes. Um, 
and now it goes to the community. And I'm really hoping that the community get involved in this. This isn't this isn't our document. This is everybody's document. This is everybody's. This is the plan for everybody's Hawkesbury. Um, it's really important that people engage with this and and give their feedback to it, so that we can come up with a development control plan that as many people as possible are satisfied with going into the future. It's taken us a very long time to get to the stage where we've been able to review our DCP. It's incredibly resource intensive. We won't be doing this again in a hurry, I don't think. So for us to have a DCP that reflects the unique nature of this space, we need everybody who's interested to, to, to get their submissions in and tell us what you want from this document. Thanks. Okay, you put the motion. Um, all those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand. Favour are Councillor Connolly, Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Ross, Councillor Zimprogno, Councillor Richards, Councillor Kotlash, Councillor Barry, Councillor Tree, Councillor Carver, Councillor Rasmussen. Declare it carried unanimously. Um, item 231 is our next item. We've got one public speaker being um, Alice Voigt. Just give Alice a moment to join the meeting. Hi, Alice. We're up to um, item 231 and uh, we're ready for address. Discussed what we wanted. Um... Yes, hello there. Hello. Ready when you are. Hi there. Um, I uh, would like to give you a little bit of insight about what's going on with the Broken Bridge. I know it's an issue which has been ongoing and most of these issues have been ongoing for years and years, not just about the Broken Bridge. Um, the amount of rubbish that is left behind is quite indicative of the type of people that come out here. 50% of them are young pea platers with hotted up cars who use the back roads to do a lot of four wheel driving. And the rest of them are families. So we get a lot of um, cars coming out here on the weekends, which I have noted in the report, um, you are sort of aware of the, the dynamics. Um, to ensure that residents are not solely and only responsible for um, cleaning up after the weekend crowds, bins do need to be on either side of the road. I have noted that um, council is responsible for one side and Crown Land is responsible for the other side. Crown Land should have been consulted about this years ago because this is not a new issue. Crown Land do need to um, and even though it may take a long time, it's an issue which isn't going to go away. So rubbish bins do need to be placed on both sides of the road. Back in September, um, you uh, held a motion to close Colo Heights Road. And in that um, uh, resolution, you guys also um, noted that the road is extremely dangerous and that's because of the pea platers, that's because of the, the, the high speeds, the blind corners and the condition of the roads. Um, if the reserve was to be opened, that would be the main concern of all residents. Um, the reserve is about two to three kilometres away from the Broken Bridge. So um, implying that people um, coming down to the bridge would be the sort of people that would be using the toilets at the reserve is just not feasible. Um, the reserve is mostly used for camping families, for day trippers from the area, um, whereas the bridge is very much used for day visits from the locals, day visits from people coming into the area. Um, so realistically, um, there, the only concerns would be that if you open the reserve, it would increase the likelihood of a quite a serious accident on Upper Colo Road. Um, and it's not some residents are keen to see at all. Um, in relation to the frequency of the collection of rubbish bins, 
Prior to the bridge becoming out in March, the bins were collected weekly. Um, the council truck would come down Comleroy Road, turn right onto Upper Colo Road, turn left and cross the bridge. And they were being collected weekly. Um, unfortunately, we understand that this will be taking resources away from other areas. But what it does mean is that people are coming into the area, whereas they would have been going elsewhere. We have at least at the moment on sunny, hot days, we have between 30 and on the west side and um, between 30 and 80 cars on the east side along Upper Colo Road. So we're getting huge amounts of traffic to, for people to access the river um, and there's no facilities for them. The toilets are not a new problem. We have been picking up human waste for decades. Um, the skip bins are not a solution um, because of the amount of flooding which we get into the area. Um, and if skip bins are only answer, uh, emptied once a month, that's a huge amount of waste and rubbish, which then gets floated away in the first um, uh, flood. Um, in your report, it does say that your, the bins having more bins would not deter people from littering. Again, it's the, it is about the clientele which is coming to the area, but it, what it would do, it would help the residents who pick up after those people. Every weekend, people are picking up rubbish, nappies, refuge, party balloons, um, broken chairs, floating devices, and we have to take it to the council tip because we don't have any uh, rubbish collection here. So we pay our own money, we pay our own time, and we take it to the tip out of our own pockets. Um, we need to uh, make sure that the report uh, does talk about taking time away to clean any rubbish and to ting facilities. But again, you've got more people coming to the area. Those are the people that were going to the reserve. They are the people that are coming from other areas. Providing a service to the community is not taking away time and resources for somebody else. I make that trip at least once a day, every day, to service my NDIS client who lives on the other side of the bridge. So I understand how long it takes, um, uh, but it is a service which council does need to provide and has needed to provide for decades. This isn't something that will go away once the uh, bridge is fixed. It is an ongoing thing which needs to be managed. Um, signage and controls to be recognised that Upper Colo Road is now the main thoroughfare for access to um, the Colo River, up, up this end of the um, river, and we do need some sort of signage and controls to help people with parking. People take up an immense amount of parking, um, and it's a, it's a 70 zone um, with blind corners. So even just re temporarily reducing um, the speed limit on Upper Colo Road near the bridge would assist. Um, because the reserve is so far away from the bridge, it's about two or three kilometres, the services which were provided at the reserve were never utilised for people visiting the bridge. The number of people are visiting the bridge is far increasing and it increases every year. And this year will increase even more due to COVID and people wanting to be out and about. Um, but uh, we do need to have permanent services there to deal with the influx of people. Um, in relation to the temporary bridge um, issues, it has taken an extraordinary amount of time to get to this point and for to not have a um, follow-up uh, phone call for the ADF um, is is a bit lacking in my point of view. I believe that um, whether or not uh, every option has been explored, just letting the ADF uh, is is not an appropriate course. Um, the bridge is the broken bridge is isolating so many people. It is a fire hazard coming into fire season. It is a flood issue making people on the um, other side of the bridge 
more isolated, and some of our most vulnerable people live over there. So getting services into my client who has who is have high funding NDIS, he is grading the road himself um, simply because um, or the the bridge is out and he's he's not able to get um, much assistance. Just letting your time expired a while ago. So if you want to, to wrap up, surely that would be good. Yep. Oh, that's it. Thank you. All right. Happy to take any questions? Yes. Any, any questions for Alice? Councillors? No? All right. Thank you for that. Oh, Deputy thank Mayor, you. do you have a question? Or? Uh, yes, I, I do have a question. Uh, thank you, Alice. Um, I just heard, wanted to know when you just said about grading the road, that's a public road, you mean? Someone's grading the road so you can get access. Yes, my client himself is grading the road after each rain in order for me to get access to provide care for him down Crabtree Gully Road. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, somebody wish to move something, councillors? No? If not, we'll let that lapse. Uh, move Councillor Zambrogno. Yes. The recommendation? Yes, the recommendation. Yeah, is there a second for the recommendation? Can uh, Councillor Calvert. Okay, any discussion, Councillors? Councillor oh, Zambrogno? I'll speak to this very briefly. I mean, you know, given what we've just heard, it's manifest that there will need to be an ongoing dialogue with Council staff. It's not good enough, in my opinion, that the recommendation that we have is merely to receive a note. And all I can say is that to be proscriptive in this motion, I think uh, isn't necessary so long as um, Alison and others in that area uh, understand that council are listening to them and will we'll take further action. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Councillor Wheeler. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Look, I'm, not, I'm not happy with receiving and noting this. Frankly, I was shocked when I read this report. Um, we, we've known that this has been happening um, in, at this site for, for some time now. And unfortunately, it's taken a, f a flood in March. And, and March was nearly nine months ago um, to, to highlight the problems with this area. And we, we're paying attention to it in large part, I think, because we've got a piece of a significant piece of infrastructure that needs replacing and so we've got eyes on this space but I, I'm really shocked by what has come back to us and the thing that shocks me most is that we are emptying these garbage bins only every two weeks now we've we've had these residents telling us for months now and no doubt telling us before that that they are picking up human feces from their drinking water supply that a major recreation spot in our LGA is being covered in rubbish and dirty nappies that these residents are having to collect and take to their own garbage bins and then take to, to the tip which they pay for. And we are emptying two bins every two weeks because it's a bit far. This, this is unconscionable. This is, this is a health hazard and this isn't good enough. To have this report come back to us, to have our parks department functioning in this way, and for us to find out that the root cause here is both people's putrid habits and our lack of ability to clean this site effectively. In our last council meeting, after five years in this space, frankly, I'm ashamed that it's come to this. What I would have liked to see out of this recommendation, and I'm working up an amendment, is a report to council, um, or at least the offer of a report to council, about a sensible way forward. Now, whether we pay local residents to clean this space and we put a, a, some sort of waste collection on private property, because apparently we don't want to put it up there in case anybody actually puts their rubbish in it, um, then let's get on to this. Because we cannot keep saying to these people, I'm sorry, you live in the boondocks, you can clean other people's poo up. Come on, this is simply not good enough. I want to move an amendment. I haven't got the words um, yet, but 
um, well, I haven't got the words typed in, that council request um, an urgent report detailing how the matter of waste and human, um, sorry, the matter of waste and, um, and toilet facilities will be provided at Upper Colo. Mr Mayor, I'll take any... In both the short and long term. Mr Mayor, I'll take any of Councillor Wheeler's suggestions into the motion proper, gladly. Yeah, can I just ask a question at that point? Um, that I think maybe... I understand, definitely understand where you're coming from. Potentially you're asking for the same report again would be my only concern instead of making a decision. Well, no, what, I, yeah. what we've so, got here is a report that says this is what we do and this is what, we, and this is what we're going to keep doing. Sorry, well, I, 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 sorry, I, was, sorry I, was, I was speaking. Sorry, Council Wheeler, I thought um, I hadn't quite finished. Um, so I think I hadn't quite finished either. Well, you'd stop speaking and said you were moving that amendment. Only because Councillor Zamponio was speaking over the top of me. So um, I, my concern would be um, that the report does actually does actually list out the options, um, the cost of the options, and give council the opportunity to implement them. Um, so if we want something else, we probably need the amendment to be more specific as to what we want looked at. That's what I was trying to say. The issue here is that all of these options come with caveats and reasons why we can't do them. I want a proposal for what we can do to fix this problem, not. None of none of this is giving us an option um, that we can move forward with in both the short and long term. It's just talking about why. Frankly, it's talking about why we do what we do, and and it's not good enough. Okay, so your amendment is, uh, which Councillor Sandbrook knows indicated he's happy with the second. Your amendment was. And I might just refer that, um, if it's okay, to comment from um, either the director of support, uh, a director of infrastructure services, or the chief financial officer, who might whoever is across this report, um, just to comment on what an additional report might be able to provide, or if there's anything we should, anything else we should be considering at the moment in this one. Yep. Yeah. CFO. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So essentially the report does lay out um, options and the costs. Um, uh, council can resolve any of those options and we will have to build those costs in, in a quarter review or, um, or budget um, as required. So um, another report is probably gonna put forward the same options with the same costs. Um, unfortunately, the limitations there are around, for example, the it's not going to change, um, but there's certainly options that a council could pursue. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what a further report, what other option it could um, suggest. I'm quite sure that there's any other. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take that as uh, well, well. I think council has probably indicated he's happy with this to be the motion, so we'll take this as the motion. Um, further discussion, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just had actually a couple of questions that go uh, to that. First of all, do we have the jurisdiction tonight to be allocating funding or is that outside of the caretaker um, provisions? I think that's what um, the CFO just said, that tonight we could go ahead and, and what I'd expected to see, for example, go ahead and say we want more regular rubbish cleaning. Um, that could be the resolution tonight. Oh, so we can do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing was, um, I know uh, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that somebody has to grade their own road uh, to be able to access it. So I'm just wondering if uh, somebody could answer what the current status is of the um, how we sometimes authorise local contractors in emergency times to do some roadworks and to do some clearing and grading, I believe. I'm just wondering, um, is there a system currently in place um, if somebody could just enlighten us a little on that, um, if, if there isn't, what mechanism would it take for us to have some sort of a system where if we can't get to all these roads, uh, how can we ensure that they are accessible for people? Um, can, can someone answer that, please? Refer that to the general manager. 
Um, I suspect councils, we might need to take that one on notice. Um, the issue of uh, members of the public grading our assets and undertaking those works is, is certainly one that's it's quite fraught, I, I would think, on a number of levels. And so um, I would much prefer to, to take your question on notice, if that's all right, Deputy Mayor, and, and provide further response. Uh, thank you, General Manager. I would be really pleased to hear that because it's it's an issue we have in all of our remote areas. We have these sorts of things happen. So, um, and particularly when people are having to access um, through another longer route, it, it's probably something we should have a mechanism at least in place to be dealing with. Um, Mr. Mayor, what, uh, may I speak now? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I support exactly what Councillor Wheeler said. When I, when I brought this up in September in the meeting, it was with the aim to get some sort of a solution for these people um, who had been waiting for months upon months uh, since the flood had occurred and they are being greatly impacted. And as Councillor Wheeler said, they are doing the, they are really doing our work essentially and picking up the litter and um, other things that they're having to deal with. And it goes to the core of this being one of our areas where we want people to appreciate the beauty and utilise it. It's public space that's uh, very popular, but we have to ensure that we have sufficient um, uh repositories, I guess you would call, so that the uh, rubbish can be put there. I think the I'm not quite sure what's happened over time with the frequency of when the bins were collected, because I know I have raised this on a number of times, not just in the last five years, but in the last nine years around the rubbish collection out at, at areas of Colo and Upper Colo. Um, and I think that I'm really, really sad that the uh, pursuit of a temporary solution for these people has not been pursued as vigorously, it would appear as possible. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to support getting forward, as Councillor Wheeler said, um, you know, we want to know what we can do, not what we can't do. We want to know what we can do to make it better for these people, um, to make it better for our whole area, to make it better for our environment, that it's not impacted the way it is. And I too am disappointed in this report. I was hoping for something that we would be able to say, well, you know, you might not be able to have absolutely everything at once, but I thought we could deliver uh, some improvements out there. And I understand we can if we allocate the money. So I'm just going to reconsider that. I was a little under the impression that I thought we couldn't do this tonight, which was why it wasn't um, a suggestion, a recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'd like to just ask a couple of questions to clarify things, please. Um, there's been mention of Crown land. Is that Crown land situated on the Colo Heights side of the river? Uh, what one might describe as the northern side? Or? Uh, refer that to the CFO. Yeah, uh, Matt is saying that's the, it's on the eastern side of the bridge. Uh, I don't know what the eastern side means. I'm sorry. Uh, could you clarify that? We've talk, been talking about west and south and whatever. Yeah, so the direction are west and east, and essentially the what was being referred to as the was just referred to as the northern side. It's actually the western side. That's the correct definition. Um, and the crown land is um, what people were referring to as south. is actually the eastern side. So that's the correct definition of the sides. Because I understand there's been some stuff out in the things out in the media that refer to north and south. So it's actually east and west. Uh, so, so could I uh, confirm that that is actually uh, Colo, uh, Upper Colo Road and can yes, you yes. Uh, indicate the DP number that is actually public land please? <clears throat> is it the, the 1198 whatever it is? My eyesight's not the good. Please. Can I ask the manager of Parks and Recreation to clarify the exact location, please? Thanks. Uh, while that's going on, could I further inquire 
In regard to the private road, which uh, in regard to the road which has um, been mentioned as being graded, is is that a private road through Crown land or is it a public road, please? I believe it's a public road, and I believe that we have um, council has actually graded that road when required as well. Okay, thank thank you. That, that's very helpful. Uh, now, the, the other point I'd like to um, just remind uh, fellow councillors of is that very early in this term, uh, and, and uh, in that I mean 2017, we, we had had somewhat similar discussions uh, over quite a lengthy period, period of meetings from memory, and council had resolved that there should be a temporary um, or, or a, a, a portable type structure to provide a living space and accommodation for um, a, if you like, caretaker within the confines of the reserve. And council had, as I understand it, uh, voted something at that stage like 50 or 60,000 uh, in which to, uh, with which to carry out that um, resolution. Now, uh, that has obviously not not been done, and um, it would appear that some consideration, um, uh, apart from what we're speaking of at the moment, needs to be given to that matter, because that that would, uh, if a, uh, the um, infrastructure and and, a, and the right person could be found, would. Um, uh, possibly enable a caretaker to, to be involved in that area, which may help with the uh, cleanliness and general um, in good order. Thank you. Is that that's a question, Councillor Ross? Yes? I can't say you're on mute, so I'm not sure. S sorry, I thought I was trying to get out quickly. Uh, I, I, I would like to raise the question of, of what has happened to those or yep. that previous uh, resolution going back to, I believe, 2017. Thank you. I refer that to Mrs. Boyer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I may refer that to the Parks um, Creation Manager. Um, my understanding is that we, ha we have not been able to find a caretaker, but um, Mr. Perry can provide details on the building itself. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just in regards to the first question, Councillor Rost asked, the lot and DP on the eastern side, that's Crown Land, is lot 7304. Um, so that, that's on the eastern side. Um, in relation to the funding that was allocated for Upper Colo, was actually, uh, to, um, as Councillor Ross indicated, was to uh, develop a building. Um, council started undertaking DA works or preparing for DA um, and we, we hit a lot of snags and as far as costs went, um, it was very high fire, fire uh, prone area um, and basically that was put on hold at this point in time. Um, so those funds I'm guessing is something council could determine to what to do um, moving forward from there. Thank you. Um, Okay, so if I some speakers in favour, anyone speaking against this motion? Councillor Richards? I'd like to move an amendment, or I'm not sure if it's an amendment or an addition to this, but I'm open to collaboration with the other councillors. I believe that, you know, we've all over this term of council made quite grand gestures about our role and what that role and responsibility is to people in our community. And when we have a resident here tonight speaking so openly about what a certain sector of our community endures, I don't think that any of us could sit here in silence and do nothing. So if you refer back to the report that we have in the business paper, uh, and knowing now that we can allocate some funding towards things, uh, even though we're in caretaker, <clears throat> excuse me, for looking at page 129, for the provision, of, for the time that... Uh, the area is, the bridge is being built. It looks like there is an extra $6,000 for a weekly bin collection and a portable toilet is $7,000 each. And of course you would need two. So that's looking at around $20,000. Uh, I'd like to move an amendment that we do both of those things as an interim measure 
Um, I, I do obviously welcome some comments from staff about where that money could be coming from, but it is $20,000. Uh, but I believe that we can't sit here and do nothing. There needs to be a way we can do that. Just to clarify, the, the motion in front of us, so that your amendment is the motion in front of us with the point two, that as an interim measure, council move to weekly rubbish collection and providing to portable toilets. Yeah, I think that that, I'm happy if that the original mover wants to add that as a point too. Uh, I'm Mr. happy to, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. I, Mr. Mayor, I've sent words to that effect through to the staff already, so that might um, great. that might make it quicker. Okay. So, all right. Let's see if we've got that to bring up. That'd be great. Um, just give it a minute. Could, could we change at least that point three to two portaloos? Would you be happy with that? I'm happy with that. It's whatever serves the purpose. That's why I said at least rather than just one. Yeah, so I think the wriggle room. If, if we can agree on two um, as a minimum, I think that's a good way forward. So I'll, I'll probably, we're probably going a little bit outside the process, but we're happy to make that the motion, Council and Brock. No, we probably should have. Uh, no, no, certainly. This is precisely the process of collaboration I was hoping would happen. Okay. All right. So we'll, do, we'll say that's still the same motion. Um, is there anyone who wants to speak against this motion or do we all agree? I want to add a point. Okay. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Is that okay? Thank you, Mr. Go Mayor. Ahead. Um, I just don't want us to get lost in the temporary solution and not be still moving forward. So just something to ensure the continuity and perhaps looking at permanent composting toilets or something down the track. Can we just ensure that there, that even though we're, we're getting a temporary solution that we don't lose sight of? So something further, to continue that. Thank a you. further report to come to council on the long-term solutions? Further report or, or yes, yep. um, a plan of management or something for that area that, that would include going forward with that. Thank you. Okay. Um, just so we'll get that staff happy to put some words there for that. We understand what's happening there. Yep. Um, looking for speakers against, if anyone just, yep, Councillor Carbett. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. It's more like uh, the deputy mayor was just saying that I saw this um, report as being the beginning of a process, not the end of the process. That's why I was happy to receive it because it, it gave us something to build on to solve all the problems. And there are many problems that need to be solved. And what we're doing here at the moment is cherry picking some of them and developing policy on the run. And I, what I was having, what I thought was going to happen was we would receive the report and then we would develop a process over the next couple of months with the new council to address all these issues. Um, I didn't see that uh, receiving the report meant that you don't do anything. I think it, it was just the opposite. You do do something and you, you answer all the questions. So if uh, what the deputy mayor just mentioned about an ongoing process goes into this motion I, I guess I'm happy to support it but it it still is cherry picking we're leaving a lot out and um, I, I would just like to see the process continued and just support whatever that last point is that the deputy mayor's putting in rather than all these little bits and pieces okay so just just confirming we we do have point seven coming um, Director of Support Services, that, that's on the way, is it? Yeah, okay. Perfect. Is that okay, Councillor Zamprogno? Fine. Thank you. Okay. Noting that we've had a number of speakers in the motion, nobody's disagreed yet. Does anybody want to disagree? Councillor Reynolds wants to. No? No. I want to speak against, basically. Councillor Reynolds. I, I think we failed to. To, to hear the speaker when she said that the issues at Upper Cola Reserve existed before the bridge went. So this isn't something that has just happened since the bridge was taken out in the flood. Um, and looking at the motion as it stands, discuss the need for grading, provide at least two portaloos, 
empty the garbage bin weekly, blah, 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 blah. And so, and when, but when the bridge is replaced and, and there's finally a new one there, the problems are still going to exist. And, and the deputy mayor touched on it. What we need is a plan of management. I, I along with councillor, agree with councillor Ross. I distinctly remember the director of infrastructure at the time speaking about the possibility of building a structure and having a caretaker there. Now that is the obvious solution. And I'm not sure whether that comes with a plan of management, that we need a plan of, ma plan of management for Upper Collar Reserve to, to, uh, to then lead to having a caretaker uh, there, employed there and having a accommodation. Um, but that is obviously, that is what is needed to fix this problem. I don't disagree with what's happening here, but it's not going to solve the big problem that um, the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Calvert spoke to. And I, I just like to ask the staff, if possible, how much do plans of management cost? Not that we need to string things out while we wait for more and more reports, but if we're going to do it and find a solution, then let's do it properly. Um, so I'd like to ask the staff how much a plan of management would cost for Upper Colo Reserve so that we can fix this I once and for all. I refer that question um, to um, somebody who wants to answer it. Um, just also, I would just add, add to that question, um, would that be something that would come back as a result of point seven in regard to a report on long-term solutions? Um, is that for the CFO or the Director of Infrastructure Services or? Um, I could answer in regard to the costs. Normally plans of management costs around between 30 and 50,000, but I'm not quite sure that that would be um, the right document to provide us with the solution. So I may refer um, to the manager part of the creation, please. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. May. Um, I guessing council has to uh, develop plans of management for um, all the crown land that it manages. Um, Upper Colo um, may have fitted under a generic plan, uh, but I guess council could consider doing an individual plan for that particular site. Um, generally, a plan of management just refers to the particular site that it oversees. The car park on the um, western side of the low level bridge is actually road reserve, not a park. Um, so that particular site doesn't require a plan of management, but as you've indicated, if there was a, a caretaker at the reserve, they could potentially go over and, and help clean or maintain that site. Um, and that has happened previously, um, approximately 15 years ago when we had a previous live on site manager at the reserve. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that if we're considering, um, uh, as we know, like the extra garbage bins and apparently the cost of two portaloos or, and the expense involved in that, I think, basically looking at the numbers here, the expense that we're looking at in the motion as it stands would basically cover the cost of a plan of management. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do this. And um, we know that um, a lot of has been made about this council wasting money, but, but I think we need to find a solution. And I'd perhaps channel a point seven could be, be provided with a further report on long-term solutions and a plan of management. Um, if Councillor Nathan would be uh, amenable to that. I think that's the, the only way to go here. As, as we've been told, as Alison said, there was a problem before the bridge went away and we're not really addressing that with this notice of motion. Uh, if I may, Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, um, perhaps the, the wording could be with a report with long-term solutions, um, including a, a potential plan of management. What I'd prefer mm -hmm. to do is to provide Council with the, the full, um, I guess, the cost of that plan of management, um, what the timing on that could look like. They, mm -hmm. um, we've got already got an extensive backlog in our, in our parks planning area. So you could be looking at sort of a, a 12 to 18 month or more process by the time we kind of get around to it. So I'd rather we provided you with, with a report as soon as possible that outlined, um, I sure. guess, how to get to the outcome that, that council's after. Yeah, that'd be good if we could have that included. Yeah, thank Happy you. with that councils and program. Uh, I'll, I'll, yes, I'll, so take the general manager's suggested words on board and amend point seven. Yep, perfect. Okay, okay. Thanks, Pat. so we've had um, all speakers now happy. Anybody else against? No, Councillor Gary, you want to agree as well? 
I just had a question, actually, Mr. Mayor, um, possibly for the manager of Parks and Recreation. I just wanted to know if there was a time frame on when the likelihood of these tangible items being put into place would be occurring. So if we so resolve the, the tonight, how long do we can get them there uh, to the director or manager? Do we need to stipulate that in this motion? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to answer that. Uh, look, it will depend on, on availability. So the things like the port um were looked at at a hire from, um, from Penrith, uh, Kenneth Hire, um, and they had them in stock and indicated they could, could bring those out. So I imagine that wouldn't that would take a week or two to get those. Um, bins, are, we already have those on site. It's just a matter of changing crews, um, uh, rosters and processes for them to include additional, um, if it was a weekly pickup that you wanted down on that site for them to go there. It's just a matter of rearranging and, and a changing that time process. So it's fairly, fairly straightforward. Okay, so yeah. there wouldn't be any need to add a time frame into this motion then? It would pretty much be effective immediately regardless? That's correct. The, the idea here is that we're asking for it as soon as, as, soon as it can yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right of reply required, Councillor Zemprogram. No, only to say, Ms Voigt, we hear you. And I hope this improves matters. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. In favour of the motion of Councillor Connolly, Councillor Garrett, Councillor Ross, Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Lance Bucket, Councillor Richards, Councillor Tree, Councillor Zemprogram, Councillor Kotlash. Against? That's everyone, wasn't it? You have to declare it carried. So our next item is item 233 and we have one speaker, Jeffrey Hudson, bring in from the waiting room. I have an interest, Mr. Mayor. If you want to read that on now, Councillor Richards. Yes, I will just find it. Uh, yes, item 233, significant non-pecuniary. Uh, I'm a member of the Hawkesbury Communications RFS Brigade, which operates out of that building, and therefore I don't believe it's been uh, it's the right thing to be sitting in the meeting tonight voting on this matter. Thank you. Councillor Wheeler. Um, thanks, Mr Mayor. Uh, I have a um, non-significant, non-pecuniary interest. I'm also a member of Hawkesbury Communications Brigade, and my son Patrick is a member of Wilberforce RFS Brigade. Um, neither my son nor I derive any personal or financial benefit from this project. Um, and so uh, that's my reason for no further action. So, Councillor Richards, did you say you're leaving the meeting? I think it's the right thing to do in this matter is to leave the meeting when you're a member of the brigade. Right, I'll put you in the waiting room. Okay. Um, so we have one speaker, um, Mr. Jeffrey Hudson. When you're ready, Jeffrey. Unmuted. Hello. Hello. You're ready when you are. Um, good evening to all. My name is Jeffrey Hudson of 108 Putty Road, Wilberforce. I'm addressing this meeting regarding item 233, Wilberforce RFS Brigade Relocation. Our property is backed onto by Wilberforce Council Depot on Old Sackle Road, Wilberforce. We do not have any opposition regarding the planned relocation of the RFS Brigade to the Council Depot, but we do have concerns with the additional stormwater and the main issue with extra wastewater flowing onto our property. Our concerns come from a recent issue which was raised by my neighbour when the wastewater from Depot was running in the northeast corner and the smell was extreme. The following procedure was completed by me. I contacted a previous council contact, Rob Ellis, who I dealt with last year, who advised me to register my problem with council to raise work order. Reported to the council 27th of September 21, had notification that had been received automatically from sophos at hawksbury.newsouthwales.gov.au and awaited for reply in 10 days. Boxes on reply email don't work. Resent emails on the 1st of October 21, same result as the 27th of September 21. Resent emails on the 11th, 12th and 14th of October 21, same result as the 27th of September 21. Resent emails on the 20th of October 21, automated reply came back. Received reply from Council 21st of October 21 from a Vanessa Buchanan 
apologizing for the delay and that a contractor would attend to investigate, but their truck had broken down and would get me in the next week. Thanked her for the response and advised that I had spoken to Rob Ellis. She informed me that she had spoken with him. Sent email to council personnel, 28th of October 21, Vanessa Buchanan, regarding that I had not heard from anyone, no reply. <clears throat> Sent email to council personnel, 2nd November 21, Vanessa Buchanan, the wastewater had stopped. Asked if this was going to be an ongoing issue in that the wastewater tank stops getting used and is then all well until it put back into operation and the process starts again. There are concerns about the new building and hard stand areas where the extra storm water and wastewater will go if the system cannot work effectively now. On a footnote, I received a phone call and email in regards to wastewater this afternoon at 5.15 p.m. Nine days later. Thank you. Thank you. Have you taken any questions from councillors if there are any? Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for that, Mr. Hudson. How, how long has it been an issue for you with um, wastewater flowing from the council depot onto your uh, property? I would say years. Any idea, like five, ten, two, three? Um, probably about 10 years ago, um, they decided to put a fence down the back of my, or we agreed to putting a fence down the back of the property and a trench so the water could go down and we were told it would be maintained. Mm -hmm. um, that work, that never got maintained. We then, uh, we started getting water running through the middle of the property and, like this, and we just kept talking to different people um, and it never really progressed until last year when a whole easement has been created along the back of the council property to stop the water running across the middle of my property. So, so the, so I was about to ask that. So th there isn't a, like a, a gazetted easement on your property. It's no. it, okay. Um, but there is now a, an easement on council's property. Is that right? Yes. But it hasn't stopped the wastewater flowing onto your property. No. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much for letting us know. Good on you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank any, you. Other questions, any other questions for Mr. Hudson? No, thank you for that, Mr. Hudson. Um, so that's our final speaker on item 233. If somebody wishes to move something, Councillor uh, Calvert. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to move the uh, recommendation in the business paper. I've seconded for that. Seconded to Councillor Zamprogno. Uh, any discussion, Councillor Calvert? Look, I just want to say how pleased I am with this result. The um, During the bushfires of 2019 and 20, um, it was actually quite embarrassing to have international visitors and the commissioner and the press come to um, our current um, facility in Wilberforce. It just wasn't adequate. It, it was, as I said, quite embarrassing. And I could see members of the press were now there looking around and being stunned. This is such a monumental event in our history, in our area. And basically we had all our workers stuck in little sheds or in an old, old building that's been there for since 1930 uh, something, I believe, or 1940 something. So this is really uh, coming um, very late and I was hoping that it would come a couple of years ago, but I suppose better late than never. And uh, as well as that, the Wilberforce shed, of course, just wasn't fit for purpose. They couldn't get the trucks in and out. You know, if they had a meeting, they had to move all the trucks out, this sort of thing. So I'm really pleased that we're making use of the space down at the depot to do this as well. So I'm really, as I said, really pleased to see this happen. And I know that when the commissioner was there during the fires, he, he also expressed a uh, surprise at the the poor facilities and said he was going to get behind and making making the change and I know he did and I know he came and spoke at um, Wesrock one of our meetings and he he mentioned how disappointing the facilities were at Hawkesbury and that he would work on fixing that and I think he might have done a bit of pushing before he left that role so uh, yes I'd like to commend this uh, this motion to everyone and 
thank the staff for drawing up uh, drawing this up. So thank you. Thank you. Um, you know the speak, uh, oh, Councillor Wheeler. Um, thanks, Mr. Miller. I want to um, <clears throat> um, second the um, what um, Councillor Calvert has just said, um, and thank him for bringing the um, the initial motion forward that I um, tacked on the Wilberforce fire shed to at the time. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the staff from both council and the RFS for getting this um, this proposal to the to where it is now. It hasn't been um, a clean or easy road. I don't think there were conflicting ideas about what were the best locations for both um, facilities, both fire control and for um, the Wilberforce fire shed. Um, and uh, we also need to acknowledge the um, the former general manager Peter Conroy, who, um, according to the captain and deputy captain or then deputy captain of Wilberforce um, were the first was the first council general manager to actually listen to their pleas for a shed that um, that met OHS requirements for them. Um, this is a this is a really good outcome. It's long overdue. There's been some really robust discussions with RFS personnel about the site that would suit them best and they're very happy um, from my understanding with the woodland site. Um, there, it's. I think it's it's excellent that this decision has been um, has been made in this term of council. I think it was a really important thing for us to see through to this stage. Um, I want to thank also the the um, and congratulate the members of Wilberforce Brigade who've worked really hard for this um, for more than ten years. I'm really pleased to see that we're using a concurrent planning and consultation phase for both projects, which hopefully will speed things up a bit. Uh, we do need to consider the reuse of the building. It's actually, a, I mean, aside from the fact that it is, in, it leaks like a sieve, it's damp, um, heaters have to be brought in to dry it out whenever there's been, I'm sure they're running this week, whenever there's been significant rain. Um, it is in parts of it, parts of it are, are beautiful um, and, and it does have significant history for the, for the Hawkesbury having been the Colo Shire Chambers. Uh, so it, we do need to consider heritage protections regardless of what we do with that site in the long term. Um, the, the Wilberforce shed no longer meets any of the requirements. Um, it, it, they don't fit in the shed. Uh, water skates through the bottom of the shed. Um, they, doesn't meet OHS standards. They can't clean their breathing apparatus currently in the shed. Um, so it, they really have moved to a, it, it, things have become desperate. Um, we have put this on off far longer than, than we should have, I think. Um, I'm interested to hear Mr. Hudson's concerns. Clearly we've got a problem on the depot site, um, which is on the, on the high point of Wilberforce. Um, and it seems that he's, got our, our storm and wastewater sheeting into his property currently that needs to be looked at urgently um, before we add to the to the load on that prop or to the to the hard surfacing on that property but I do want to um, make mention of Mr Organ's fairly ingenious solution where he has effectively conjured a piece of land that didn't exist um, out of out of that space which will hopefully work well for both the council depot and for um, and for the, for the Wilberforce Brigade. The only thing that's missing here, I think, is a projected timeline, which would give both um, headquarters, um, or, sorry, fire control and um, Wilberforce some certainty as to where they're headed now and how long they ha we, everyone has to function in the facilities that we've got. Thank you. So we've got a couple of speakers in favour. Are there any speakers against? Councillor Reynolds. Against, yep. In a, in a manner of speaking, more, more questions, Mr Mayor, actually. Of staff, I'm concerned about the issues Mr Hudson raised with the issues of uh, a case of, of wastewater running onto his property from the depot. Could staff tell me if uh, this is just a natural flow from one property onto another, or has the water been collected in a drain and, and then is flowing from a drain onto Mr. Hudson's property. Is that possible? I'll refer that to the Chief Financial Officer. Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Probably that's quite a technical detail there um, don't, that I don't have the answer on hand. Um, 
But what I can tell you is that um, we've been um, looking at how we manage um, that, that flow and um, we, we will be improving how we maintain that system. So um, the so that there is no accumulation um, on the on the trench um, that Mr. Hudson is referring to, but also the quality of the water will be managed better. So, um, so essentially, it won't be um, dirty water. That's I, the ex with the existing, like without the, the building, we're already working on on a solution for it. Yeah, that, that was one of the questions that I was going to ask. Is it is it just natural runoff, or or is it actually contaminated from you know, works that are normally carried out at the depot with um, various oils and other things. Um, I, I know from personal experience, I've been in Mr. Hudson's situation, you know, about 30 years ago, and I know it's illegal for someone to collect water and then run it onto someone else's property. And I'm concerned that that is what is happening here, even though the, the, the drainage system on the depot may not be capable of, of, um, uh, of handling um, runoff in an extreme situation. But uh, it, it does call, cause me great concern that he is, and he and his family and his property uh, are suffering something that um, of all people, of all organisations, council should be on top of. Um, and I'd just like to ask Emma if, this is going to be looked at seriously so that we can find a solution to Mr. Hudson's issue after, you know, what, 10 or more years. Yeah, I was going to actually ask you as well before I pass that on. Um, probably not the best format to be dealing with a, an individual property matter um, in the council meeting, but obviously Mr. Hudson's felt very strongly about the fact that it might not be being dealt with uh, in, I, I, I th I think, in a way I think, that he feels satisfactory. So I was going to ask potentially if we could have um, a memo go to councillors um, in the following days as to what's happened and what the proposed solution is, just so we can make sure we're doing the right thing by Mr Hudson. Yeah, but, but with due respect, Mr Mayor, this is to do with the relocation of the Wilbur Force Fire Brigade shed to the depot. Yeah, that's no, referring, really just yeah. to clarity, referring both questions, not not, not, not referring yours. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, we, and if I may, um, Mr Mayor and Councillor Reynolds, um, certainly, certainly happy to, to circulate to councillors um, the advice with respect to Mr. Hudson's property after we've had the opportunity to have a look into it. Um, if anything, in my experience, um, the sort of whatever we're talking, seven odd million dollar um, capital investment um, down there at the depot site, this will allow us the opportunity to, to have a look at those systems and make sure that the drainage is actually operating effectively um, and that, that if there's overland flow issues and those sorts of things that we can, we can rectify those rather than exacerbate them. Yeah, I mean, we don't want, it, don't want to exacerbate what has been an issue for an unaddressed issue for nearly 10 years. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go right of reply, Councillor Calvert. Thanks, it's me. I just want to firstly say I assumed, uh, as the general manager has said, that uh, this development will actually go to fixing the problem that Mr Hudson has rather than making it worse. So... Um, I'm hoping that's happened, but I, going to happen. But I'll wait for the um, the memo to come through. Now, secondly, I just want to say that what we've got here is an investment in the future of our community, a very big investment, one that's going to look after our community in those situations like we had in 2019 and 20. So, uh, yes, thank you very much for everyone who's been part of making this happen. Thank you. We'll put the motion. Um... All those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand. In favour of Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Connolly, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Lance Bucket, Councillor Gary, Councillor Ross, Councillor Tree, Councillor Kotlash, Councillor Rasmus, and Councillor Zambrogno declared it, declare it carried. Um, our next item is notice of motion one. Um, so we have one speaker, Mr. Robert Buchanan. Let's wait for um, um, Mr. Buchanan to be. I have a. Problem. Yeah, and if you want to declare your interest. Um, um, it's the same interest as for item 229. Would you like me to read it again? Yes, please. Okay, I'm a member of the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area Advisory Committee. This committee has been recently 
This committee has recently been briefed on the EIS of this project. And while the committee has not yet met formally, the level of opposition to the project has become clear. I therefore feel that it is inappropriate for me to be involved in deliberations on any of these matters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Kotlash, the waiting room. Mr. Mayor, okay. have we got Councillor Richards back? I believe we have. Councillor Richards, yep, good. Okay, Mr. Buchanan, you're our um, first speaker. We're ready, we're ready when you are. Are you muted at the moment? So another go. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm Rob Buchanan. I live in Richmond Lowlands and I speak in favour of the motion. Um, in the first decade of this millennium, Queensland endured a major drought. By Christmas in 2009, dams in Queensland were at an all-time low, with Wyvernhoe at below 20%. The drought broke in 2010 as a result of a change in the La Nina weather pattern. The, Wilbur, the Wyvernhoe Dam had been designed in response to a serious flood in the 1970s. Its purpose was to part, to part, uh, was part water security part flood mitigation. Based on the drought experience, those operating the dams aired on the side of caution as the rains came in 2010, resulting in an almost full dam by December. As, pre uh, as predicted by the meteorologists, the La Nina rains continued. As the rains continued, it became apparent there was some risk of dam failure if the water was allowed to overtop the spillway. A, design, uh, a decision was taken to open the floodgates of the Wyvernhoe Dam to reduce water levels to prevent overtopping at the same time that an extreme rain event occurred. An already soaked catchment meant that all rain which fell flowed into the Brisbane River at the same time as the water from the dam was spilled. Thousands of homes were submerged. The Queensland Flood Commission of Inquiry made many recommendations. Amongst these, was that the operational strategy and operating manual be reviewed to ensure that if that situation occurred again, flood mitigation would be at the top of the agenda above water security. In Hawkesbury, an identical situation currently exists. The Warragamba Dam sits at 98.9%. La Nina is now converting into its wet phase with the effects we have seen over the last few weeks. Last year, we were sweltering in the dry. This year, it's rained virtually every day in November. Rain in the Warragamba catchment has been significant. The only difference between us and Queensland is that the state government here has legislated the Warragamba is solely for water storage. So there's absolutely no discretion on the part of the operator to spill water to, to mitigate against the effect of rain events. In March this year, we had a trial run for all of this here. I don't need to describe to you the effects um, because I've been in Brisbane in 2010 and 11. Um, in the lead up to our event, I made inquiries of Water New South Wales about when they intended to open the floodgates for our dam, which was already at 100%. Um, they, they told me nothing and referred me to the Bureau of Meteorology, which, was, which has no information on dam operation and the State Emergency Service who could not tell me what New South Water New South Wales plans were either. Um, the SES did say that there was a prospect of minor flooding. When Water New South Wales opened the floodgates, there was little prior warning. By then, of course, we'd worked out that we were on our own and had evacuated livestock, machinery and ourselves from the lowlands. In my opinion, March was a man-made flood, which was made worse by a lack of advice from Water New South Wales about its intentions. There's been a lot of spin about uh, from the state government since March about this, but there's been no action to mitigate the effect of a repeat performance. Times have changed since the state legislated that the Warragamba Dam was water storage only. We have a desalination plant which can produce 250 million litres of water a day, and our understanding of weather patterns like La Nina and rainfall has developed. Right now, we can pretty confidently say that there will not be a drought in the next year. We need to use those advances in our favour. We need to empower the operators of our, of our water assets so that they can act in our best interests. In March, we knew what was unfolding for weeks before the event. 
had the dam been drawn down prior to the March rain events, it would have given the community um, an extra few days of buffer to evacuate and mitigate the effects of flood on properties. Importantly, the water coming down the river would not have been what was falling in the catchment downstream of the dam, plus what was coming out of the dam. An agile approach to the March event would have saved the state and the communities a lot of time, distress and money. Happy to answer questions. Thank you. Are there any questions, Mr. Buchanan? No. Uh, Councillor Reynolds? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to move um, this notice of motion. i get someone to second it. Seconder. Councillor Ross. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. The, the purpose of this notice of motion isn't to, it's not really to, to get involved in the, the issue of whether Warragamba Dam should be raised or not. It, it's about providing some mitigation for the Hawkesbury and the PN as it is, as it is now. And as we face um, what is forecast to be one of the uh, where to sum, summers um, some decades. We know that the dam is, I think Mr Buchanan said it's about 98 or 99% full. Now Water New South Wales says that it is not allowed, it is not allowed to lower the dam level or draw down the water level in preparation of forecast rain. It can only draw down the water level once the rain is falling into the catchment. Now, in, in, in their uh, reasoning for increase, increasing the dam wall, infrastructure for New South Wales has said that the advances in um, modelling meteorology, modelling the, the forecast in rain will allow them to operate uh, an increased um, dam wall um, with reasonable accuracy. Now, the same thing could be done now with the dam as it exists, the, we know that the government decided last year to double the size of the desalination plant in Sydney. The, so the, the, there is no issue with water supply. All we want is the government to allow water, water New South Wales to draw down the water level in Warragamba Dam when the Bureau of Meteorology is forecasting um, increased rainfall. It also this is just preparation. Um, and I think it's um, a bit of a no brainer really. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll speak to the motion. Does somebody have YouTube open? That issue again, it's a bit of an echo there. Um, I wanted to speak to the motion briefly and Look, I'm, go I'm going to support the motion because there's nothing wrong with having some flexibility. Um, it's not, I can't see anything problematic with the state government having that option. However, I did want to draw attention and just counter some of the things that have been said that I think have probably been incorrect um, in regards to what impact this would have. Um, back, after the, back after the March flood, I, I got in touch with um, Infrastructure New Wales about this exact issue because many river, riverbank land, uh, river Bank landowners had raised this with me that this was the this was the um, solution to flooding was to be able to let water out sooner, and um, I through that contact had a, a really good educational experience with a couple of briefings and some conversations, um, and one of the one of the documents I was directed to, which I think spells this out really well, is the um, presentation of infrastructure of Wales to the Upper House Inquiry um, into Warragamba Dam, um, and it talks about all the different options for flood mitigation, um, raising the dam, um, permanently lowering the dam level by 12 metres, permanently lowering it by five metres, um, and what they called an unrealistic pre-release and a realistic pre-release, and what impacts each of those measures would have had on the flood uh, peak uh, in, in the March flood. Um, noting that the March flood at Windsor, I think peaked, peaked at 13.5 something metres. Um, so they've modelled two scenarios on the 18th of March, uh, which is about 10 days before the, the major flood event, um, there was a 25% chance uh, of, a, of, of more than 140 millimetres of rain at that point in time. Um, if they went ahead um, and started releasing water based on a 25% chance of that rain, 
um, which is you know, a questionable practice, obviously, and that's what they call an unrealistic pre-release. But if they went ahead and did that on a, based on 25% um, forecast and released enough water um, to be able to replenish it from that rain event, it would have, uh, the modeling, the, the hydraulic modeling shows it would have released the peak flood height by 26 centimetres of, of a 13.5 metre flood. Um, if they'd waited to the 19th of March, um, when the median forecast is more certain um, and begun the pre-releases at that point, uh, it would have reduced the flood peak, flood, flood peak by less than 10 centimetres. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll support the motion. There's nothing wrong with the government having this flexibility, um, but I think that um, any, any thought that this is gonna solve the problem or have any, any significant impact is, is flawed thinking and it's likely to give um, a false sense of security to, to residents. Um, and I think we've got to be really clear about that. Um, nothing wrong with asking for it, so they've got the option, um, but let's not kid ourselves. This is, a, this is a significant part of the solution either. Councillor Zamprogno. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, and I certainly echo and endorse uh, your remarks. Those figures are relevant and accurate. And look, I'm also prepared to support this, but like you, Mr. Mayor, I don't want this to be seen as a substitute for activism to have Warragamba Dam raised. The EIS tells us that you would have to lower the permanent water storage level by 25 metres to have the same mitigating effect as raising the dam by 14 metres. The EIS also makes it clear that by 2041, the act of permanently lowering the water storage level, which would require substantial um, capital works to readjust the intake and outflow levels and so forth, would be three times less effective in preserving life and property than the current proposal to raise Warragamba Dam. So I don't see this as a, an acceptable substitute, but I'll endorse this purely for the reason that we should never miss an opportunity to advance uh, the debate on this issue and to speak on behalf of this community, which is at the greatest risk. I tend to agree with you, Mr. Mayor, that these kinds of proposals aren't backed by the data, but they come from a good place. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll also support it. And just to that point about data, I would really love to see the raw data around uh, some of the alternatives in the EIS that they say have uh, been looked at, because I still don't think that we have seen the raw data despite asking for it. Um, my concern with anything around this is amending the legislation um, to essentially make the dam dual use. I know that with the Wybenho Dam, the fact that it was dual use was uh, part of the problem. Uh, I don't think that um, I don't think that this motion is talking about the permanent lowering of water in the dam. I think it's about using um, release of water. Councillor Sambrogno was just speaking about it as if it was going to be lowered over time. And, and I think this is a, a measure that is specifically related to when the dam's at capacity and that there would be some release from there. I would be very keen to see what sort of legislative amendments um, would be required to enable that uh, because it does concern me. I have huge concerns around um, the water supply, as you would know, because I talk about it all the time, the water supply with the growing uh, three quarters of a million people coming into Western Sydney and how they're going to get their water. I think that desalination will be part of the answer to that. But I, I certainly uh, support getting this underway. I would hope that at some point we see the actual data around why this was dismissed as one of the, um, obviously for flood mitigation, we've got to have a multi-pronged uh, approach to it. We've got to have a number of things. Uh, I feel it's been remiss of um, us, not us, but the government, but of the whole thing to not pursue uh, various other flood mitigation strategies that we know, even if they're only minimal, that we know they can contribute to making everyone safer. And I think that we also know that there's a growing unpredictability around the modelling with flooding due to climate change and so on. So um, I'm happy to support this and I'll be interested and hopefully I'll be around to see what the 
response is uh, when this comes back, but um, I, I hope it would come with some actual data from when this was looked at before so we could see that because it's easy to throw around just things that are in the EIS, but we also know that there were some omissions and some uh, failure to support some of the information in there. So I thank Councillor Reynolds for bringing it forward. Thank you. Um, Councillor, are you speaking against? Uh, I'm a bit ambivalent, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, yeah, my concerns relate to, um, to, to my understanding of the problems with dual purpose dams. Um, so there's, there's a number of issues involved here, I think, that the problem that, that we know is that people watch the dam levels and they're either really anxious or reasonably comfortable, depending on what that dam level is. Now, we also know that the flooding doesn't all come through the dam and that that dam can rise and fall very quickly. But what we also know is that our modelling and our weather, um, our weather forecasting is, is now far better than it was. Um, Wyvernhoe showed that dual purpose dams that, um, that try to both supply water um, and provide flood mitigation aren't workable. And I think what's really interesting uh, following from what um, Mr Buchanan said is that Wyvernhoe will now be used to, for flood mitigation over water supply, that, that its primary purpose in fact has been changed. Uh, that's a really significant change for that dam. I know when the, de when the Deputy Mayor and I were in Queensland a few years ago at the, um, at the floodplain risk management meeting, the expert commentary there from people who participated in that inquiry was that the fact that they were attempting to keep water in there to supply water to, to residents meant that it was not able to to meet its flood mitigation requirements, and we know what the result was that was, was from that. It was disastrous. Um, I think it's fair to say that 90%, that the dam being held at 90% or above, particularly in a wet season, is far too high when they know the implications of this at the tail end of the floodplain. Um, interestingly, on the weekend, I was at the Pioneer Village AGM and Robin Preston was there, and, of course, the village is still recovering from the flooding in March. And Robin made the comment that she would be visiting Melinda Pavey, the Minister for Water's office on Monday morning, asking her to get Water New South Wales to let out more water to help um, with flood mitigation because we're about to have two more weeks of wet weather. I guess I'm talking myself into supporting this notice of motion. I think at the end of the day, we're going to find, <clears throat> if we look at, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the evidence and the information dispassionately, <coughs> that there's no silver bullet um, for, for this floodplain, that it will be a combination of a number of alternatives, dam level evacuation routes, better warning, better modelling and responsiveness to forecasting and much, much tighter planning controls and, and an ability to deal with the development that we have already on the floodplain. But I think there's also no silver bullet to water supply either. But leaving the dam so full in a wet season is just not a reasonable way forward. If this is the mechanism that we've got to appeal for better management of that um, of that dam height, then um, I'm I'm willing to support it. Okay. So so far everyone's supporting it. Councillor Cal, are you going to try and change your mind? Yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Good. Uh, Look, when we discussed the raising of the dam wall, I was a, I spoke and voted against that because I saw it as a, a single response to a very complicated issue. And what I see here again is another single response. I, I've always said what the state government needs to do is put in a very comprehensive plan to address flooding right across the Hawkesbury. And as Councillor Wheeler just said, there are a whole lot of whole range of things that need to be addressed. So I, I would be happy uh, to um, support this if Councillor Reynolds was to change it in a way that said that we would like the state government to, uh, to develop a comprehensive plan that addresses flooding in the Hawkesbury and that the two points that he's put up should be part of that plan. 
So I'll leave that with Councillor Reynolds to consider. Otherwise, I'll be voting against it in its current form. Thank you. I'll just note that there is already a, a comprehensive plan from the state government that's been developed in partnership with council and it does list a whole series of actions, many of which are already underway. But, um, uh, any further speakers? If not, we're right of reply, Councillor Reynolds. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, the, 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 issue, the issue is that if, if the government does decide to raise the wall of the dam, that won't be in operation as flood mitigation for at least five years, possibly eight years. What we have is an issue that we need to deal with now, where we have ample water supply and we're facing um, obviously a wet season. Even, even, even the local MP, Robin Preston, is uh, supporting the idea, and I didn't know that she was until now. Um, so I think it's, again, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, I think quote, quoting the EIS is a bit rich when, you know, the, the Upper House inquiry has shown that it's flawed and information was left out of it. I agree with the local, uh, sorry, with the Deputy Mayor when she said that um, we're still waiting on uh, information regarding overland flooding, which we haven't received. Um, so. But that, but that, that whole Warragamba Dam EIS issue, EIS issue is off to the side. This is about providing some mitigation now. And um, I know from helping people just down the road, not far from me now, that, you know, 26, 26 centimetres is the difference between people having their water in the house and, and not having water in the house here. So it's not something that, um, you know, is... Uh, it, you know, should be dismissed as, as not being, uh, um, uh, you know, relevant. So um, I hope you support it anyway. Thanks, Pat. Okay, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Favourite Councillor Connolly, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Lance Bucket, Councillor Zimbrogno, Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Gary, Councillor Ross, Councillor Tree, Councillor Rasmussen, Councillor Richards, against. Councillor Calvert, declare it carried. We'll let Councillor Cotlash back in. Um, so that was our final item with this public speaker. So now we go back up to item 225, the review of the LEP. Uh, interest, what, declaration of interest, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Um, I'd like to declare a... Um, special pecuniary interest in that my property is mentioned in the LEP amendments. The property is uh, my home. The land is currently under a land reservation acquisition by what was the RMS. Now Transport for New South Wales, it was applied in 2012 and the EIS, uh, sorry, the um, LEP plans to remove that land reservation acquisition. I'm um, using clause 4.36, I think it is, because I haven't got my iPad open, to um, declare this interest. Thank you. And I'll be staying in the meeting. Thank you. And I'll just note uh, the record that that um, special disclosure form has been tabled um, with myself, the general manager. Um, that was the only interest to be declared. Councillor Zemprogno. Mr Mayor, I'd like to move uh, the recommendation in the business paper, but with your indulgence, ask a question to staff first that may vary it. Um, through you, Mr Mayor, the recommendation suggests that we uh, endorse this uh, LEP and then subject to advice provided by the Hawkesbury Local Planning Panel, then submit it directly to uh, DPIE for gateway determination. Can I ask through you, Mr. Mayor, um, what kind of emendation that body may, or recommendation may make, and whether it would be better if that would be reported back to the chamber before going off to gateway? So I'm wondering what kind of advice they're going to make and whether it's worth us seeing this again. Yeah, I'd like to refer that to the Director of City Planning to know 
Councillor Zamperino's question, in addition to that, um, regardless of um, what, what kind of advice, is it up to Council to ask that to come back to us um, before it goes in? Um, thank you, through you, Mr Mayor. It, essentially, we would be replicating this report um, to the local planning panel to a much effect. Um, and if Council um, would prefer to have a report come back to Council following the advice sought by the local planning panel, then uh, that would be fine for Council officer to do that. So, so, Mr Mayor, that, that doesn't quite answer my question because uh, whether I add a clause to this to specify that this comes back to the Chamber it depends on what kind of recommendations or small changes they make. I'd like to get this to Gateway with dispatch, but if they're going to be suggesting things that are more substantial, then it should come back to us. So how do I know which way to fall? I think the answer was that they'll get the same report that we will, and they'll consider it in the same way that we are and decide whether they need to provide us any advice or not. Yes. All right then. So on, on, to apply a precautionary principle, I will move the three, the three points in the recommendation, but amend point three to say that uh, subject to the advice provided by the Hawkesbury Local Planning Panel, that a report be returned to Council prior to submission for gateway determination. Seconded for that. Seconded, Councillor Kotlash. Further discussion? Yes, I'll just speak to this briefly, Mr Mayor. I think this is vastly overdue, and it feels like we're doing this at the last gasp at our last meeting of this term. Uh, I've, like many of my fellow councillors, have felt a particular sense of ownership over this process. There were eight different workshops that we participated in that some, but not all councillors, chose to uh, avail themselves of so that we were woven into the, the process of formate, uh, forming this document. It isn't without its flaws, but I think it's an excellent thing to, to advance at this point. I'm glad to say that design excellence principles are going to be written into our LEP. Um, but I'm disappointed that those design excellence principles are likely only to apply to the town centres of Windsor, South Windsor and Richmond, not to North Richmond, not to Vineyard, where we're about to have substantial development, not to other areas. Okay. Um, Oops. I, I, I would like, uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see both secondary dwellings and detached dual occupancies in this LEP which uh, I perceive as a particular issue where the people uh, that live on acreage properties would love to see some reform and that we're actually adopting a very... Um... Sorry, I'm just reading a message from the general manager. That's now moot. Sorry, I'll move on. Um, uh, I'm very pleased to... Uh, see this and, and, and want to see it indoors. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. If uh, I may, Mr Mayor, sorry, my yes. message to Council Zampronio was um, perhaps that we only report it back to Council if the if the Hawkesbury Planning Panel make an amendment um, to the rec to the endorsement um, that, that Council will be seeking tonight. Um, uh, otherwise, we won't be able to send it to Gateway. Uh, I, I, I agree. So perhaps I could further amend point three to say that um, if if the planning panel um, recommend substantive change or, or significant change or relevant change, then it be reported back. Otherwise, that it be dispatched to Gateway if people are prepared to take that form of words. I, I mean, not just offer probably some commentary, because I would be more comfortable if any change, then it was reported back to Council um, so that we know what's going into Gateway, whether or not the staff think it is that significant or not. I'd prefer that Council make um, that decision. Well, Mr. Mayor, I mean, I think the general manager makes a good point is that if they suggest, if they recommend no change or very trivial changes of a typographical nature, then there's no reason for it to suffer the additional delay of having to come back to the chamber. So is there a seconder for that motion then? Seconded Councillor Reynolds. Okay. Uh, and, my, and my remarks stand, thank you. Okay, um, further discussion, no? In which case will uh, Councillor Wheeler? Anyone else wishes to discuss? Maybe just raise your hand on Zoom now. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, I want to thank the staff for their work. This is a really significant body of work. This is probably, this is certainly one of the most significant pieces of work 
um, from us in this term of council. This is the place-based planning that, that we asked for at the beginning of our term. This is what we committed to um, when we wrote our community strategic plan. And this is what many of us came to this term of council asking for, um, this, this level of high quality place-based planning. Um, I think it's we've, we've learned a lot about the makeup of our LGA by having to go through this process. I'm, I'm really pleased that in, in many ways we were forced into it by the state government. Um, we were forced into allocating significant resources to get it to this point with a timeline that we found, well, the staff found extraordinarily difficult with the lack of resources. Um, and you know, for, for anyone who is watching at home and isn't aware, other councils were given two and a half million dollars from the state government to carry out this work. We were given nothing larger councils with larger strategic planning units and more resources were given money and we were given nothing. Um, the staff have coped extraordinarily well with, I think, with the constraints of time and budget. Um, we've had some, some pieces of work that all of us would have liked to get through um, that have been held off and some of the, the heritage work, the urban tree canopy work has all gone on the back burner to get these documents through because the same team provides all of that work. I want to particularly thank uh, Mr. Kearns and Ms. Perrine for their work in this in this area. It's I know that it's put them under enormous pressure. Um, they have been incredibly good at working with us, at listening to us and involving us in the process. Um, I talk to councillors all over New South Wales. There is not a single council where their council laws have been involved in a rewrite of both the LEP and the DCP to the extent that we have been involved. So I really want to thank the staff for, for allowing us to, to, to have such an input into this document. I know that often we're pedantic and not particularly well informed and it can be really pie in the sky um, with, with some of the things that we want and they manage to navigate that, that space very well. I think they put up with our, our arguments and our differences of opinion and our competing agendas um, and, and managed the process really well. It was much nicer when we could all be in the same space. We had some really robust discussions. I think they were really useful. Uh, it was much harder via Zoom. Uh, but I think this is, this is probably, I'm so pleased that this has made it to this last meeting uh, because I think this is one of the, the big achievements of this term of council. Councillor Richards. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of questions. And forgive me if I'm wrong here, but had we as councillors seen this planning proposal before Thursday when we were given access to the business paper? I don't believe so, but General Manager, go for that. Uh, I will refer to the Director of City Planning if I've got this wrong, um, but no, not in, not in its totality. Um, my understanding was, though, that the, the, the local environmental plan was developed um, over the course of regular workshops with councils and, and feedback was provided through that mechanism. Yeah, and I intended, I think, pretty much all, if not most, of those workshops. But I believe, I mean, sorry, but this has been a significant flaw when we are considering, su considering such a significant document and something that as councillors, we have all given quite a lot of criticism to what happened in 2012 and the amount of housekeeping amendments we had to make since then because of all the issues with 2012 LEP, that we were given this in a business paper on a Thursday to vote for on a Tuesday where we didn't even have a briefing as a group of councillors and staff together to see this final document. I think that is a, sorry, I can't hide it, a massive flaw of this whole process. Um, you know, we are, we are the custodians of what's going to be a, the future of the Hawkesbury. And I, I mean, I just think that that should have, given the fact that we were running on a deadline, which we were told for months was June or July, forgive me again for not being accurate on that. And then all of a sudden there was a whatever, however long it takes until we get it right. And then it's just a rush through the door with the last, uh, the actual planning proposal. And I'm, you know, I'm very respectful of staff and always have been, but I believe this is a significant flaw in the process of how we have done this. Um, secondly, we're in this, um, the recommendation tonight or in this process, if I may ask, where does the Hawkesbury public get to have their say? 
Throw that to the planning or general manager. Sorry, I didn't hear who wants it. Yeah, I'll look, I'm certainly happy to, to take that one at a really high level. So um, the, the system in which we're working, obviously, is that um, council endorses this um, planning proposal. We send it to Gateway. Um, it will um, be with um, the Department of Planning, typically for a, some period of, of months, um, usually. Once we've got that um got that endorsement and got that gateway, that is when we embark on, on a, a fairly rigorous um, and extensive community consultation program um, once that has come back from the Department of Planning. So what happens if any members of the public want to make significant changes along in that consultation period, even though there may be a gateway determination? And forgive me, I just think it's important that everybody knows process. Yeah, and, and absolutely, and they, they can happen throughout that process. I, I think the manager of strategic planning is here and he may have some advice on more detail there, Andrew. Uh, yeah, thank you, um, General Manager. Um, so yeah, a, a planning proposal can be uh, uh, changed at any time during the process of um, you know, considering the, the proposal, and that could be as a result of a number of things. It could be a, resu a result of the gateway determination that uh, has the various conditions that um, uh, council has to comply with it could be as, as a result of public agency comments um, and, and, and input and it could also be as, as a result of uh, community uh, input and, and submissions as, as part of that process so it, yeah essentially can be changed at any time during that process okay because i think the other thing that we've done you know pushing this through at the last meeting of council the other thing that we've been speaking about quite heavily throughout this term of council is making sure the hawkesbury community and the public have their say so I think that, um, as I, again, if it's the state government saying what this process is before it goes to Gateway, they don't get a say, um, what can we do? But they do need to be able to have an opinion on this because, um, and I'm glad that you've verified that if anyone in the community wants to make any changes, uh, they can. I believe that we would have to go through a very big process with the community in terms of advertising, whether we're having public consultation sessions, in-face sessions, Zoom sessions, whatever it is with the community, and know that they have the ability to give that feedback because otherwise that goes against everything that we've been standing for as councillors with transparency, accountability and, um, you know, public input into our decision making. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just I just found this was pushed through at the end. I, I'm not happy with the way it was pushed through. I wasn't happy that we weren't given this document at a briefing for us all to discuss together before we were just supposed to send it to, to the planning panel and to Gateway. Uh, I believe a report should come back to council regardless from the planning panel um, and then we can make a decision from there. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm just not happy with the way it's planned out tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Richards. I, I too was quite disappointed um, in this process, given that it was originally, we originally did have a deadline of mid-year, um, obviously we had a flood, which we have to take into account, but um, at that time when we still thought it was due mid-year, I, I made, I sort of certainly communicated um, my desire that we should have um, a public exhibition period, even though it wasn't compulsory at the start of this process, because no doubt when we get to I think it's July next year, we're slated to be talking to the public. There will be pressure not to make significant change and start the process again. Um, and it would be much better if we had a chance to have feedback from people before we voted on it. But we do find ourselves in the situation of this is the last penny of the term. This is the first time we've seen it. And we really have to make a call one way or the other. So I think, uh, like you, I would have preferred that um, it come back after it goes to the, the local planning panel. But um, if that's not what council wants to do, then I guess this is the process. Councillor Reynolds. Councillor Reynolds? Oh, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I know. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to get it unmuted. Um, we've had access to most of this information for, uh, you know, some of it for, for months now. Um, we've had an LEP review panel um, comprising uh, industry people, real estate agents, developers, whatever, who've had input into it. Um, we've been involved in, I think it might be seven or eight workshops. Um, I, I managed, it came out on Thursday and despite everything that's going on, I managed to read most of it. Um, it's going to Gateway, it's not locked in. This isn't the end of the process and public consultation on the final document is, is yet to happen when it, when it comes back from Gateway. I do not see the issue. I just don't see the issue. You've been involved from the get-go. 
and as Councillor Wheeler said, that's a rare occurrence in, in, a, in, a, in a council. Um, so I think it's, a, it, it's you know, I, th I, th I think any attempt to put this off is, um, is um, um, cause for concern. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cutlash. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd just like to ask a question uh, about the process. Um, I too am not that, that happy with it only because this is a huge amount of work. And um, I think um, I, I agree with um, Councillor Richards. I, I, I wanted to have the, the whole document and um, and go through it once again. And I, I've been involved in the in the workshops as well. So, but anyway, my question on process, just to start off with, is that what sort of changes would would um, what what degree of change would lead us to have to go back to gateway? Do we have to go back to gateway if we change this significantly, or at to what degree? That to Mr. Cairns. Um, yeah, it would probably depend on obviously that level of change. And so there was, you know, if there was certainly new um, new elements added to the uh, to the planning proposal, then then it's highly likely would have, would have to go to gateway. Um, that's probably the, the, the main thing is is yeah, if new if new uh, elements were added. Yeah. Okay. Um, the way. The way I saw the um, the process with the workshops was was excellent, and I agree with what's been said about that process. And it was and it was wonderful that we had that option to be um, to be immersed and be included in that process. But what I don't agree with is that we all had our input, and some of us agreed on things, and some of us disagreed. Now the staff went away and put together what they thought was, uh, I guess, a consensus. But we didn't really have that consensus. It wasn't our consensus. So I think we need a process that, like I'm not happy with the design excellence. I think that's, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think we should have that. Um, that's just part of it. And I, I think I expressed that at the time. So all of those things, um, I, I don't think we're, we've had enough time to be able to discuss those and reach a consensus. And it definitely is not going to happen when we're all reading, you know, our business papers for four days. And it's a huge business paper. I haven't given it the, the, the time, the thought and the process that it deserves. It's a huge document. It's a really important document. So no matter what, I, I want this to come back to council. And that's why I, 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 I seconded when that, that motion that it comes back, irrespective of what the changes are. I think we need to have that extra level. Um, look, I'll leave it at that. I know it's um, it, we're on a, a schedule tonight, but I don't think the process is um, quite there yet. Thank you. Um, and, and just for clarity, this is the, the first time we've seen the documents. We haven't had the documents for months. We've had broad conversations around the proposed changes and things at workshops. We've not had the documents uh, until, until Thursday. Um, so we're going to write a reply, councillors and program. Uh, none needed, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to endorse this. Okay, so put the motion. Uh, all those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand. Uh, in favour of the motion, uh, councillors and program, councillor Calvert, councillor Lyons Bucket, councillor Reynolds, councillor Wheeler, councillor Ross, councillor Garrow, councillor Cotlash, against. Councillors Connolly, Councillor Richards, Councillor Tree. Yep, against. Uh, declare it carried. Um, so then we move on to, sorry, item 230 on domestic sellage. Somebody wish to move something there? Recommendation, Councillor Kotlash? Seconded for that? Yes, I'd like to move the. Um the recommendation in the business paper with uh, with a tiny okay. change, and I'm just sorry, I'm just going down. What number is it? Um, Two thirty. Sorry. <clears throat> Look. 
Look, I think this is a really good report and, uh, oh, somebody seconded it yet? No, because you need to know what your change is. Oh, change, sorry. Um, in point two, I'd like to change point two to read, um, review the sullage service prior to the expiration of the current contract in May 2023 um, and report back to council. Um, I think that should read report back to council um, on services and, and contract options and associated financial and environmental regulatory considerations. Um, I'd like to also add that one of the options that's explored is council carrying out its own um, silage collection. And I think there's a reference to that on page 106 of the business paper. And it says that that's, that is another option. And I'd like that option to be explored in terms of council being able to provide that service with net zero emissions. So I'd like council to explore whether we could get some grant funding to get an electric um, truck, uh, whether we could we, we could supply you know, power to that truck from some council facility that, that has excess power from solar panels. I'd really love to see us make a, a really big statement and lead in this area of, of net zero emissions of our operations. We have the opportunity. Unfortunately, it's obvious that we have to wait yet another, uh, another year. Um, so there's not a lot of action on this, unfortunately, until then. Um, but I think that that's, I think that would be a good outcome. I don't mind if that's a, an additional point or it's in, in included in point two. <clears throat> okay, so second for that. Second of Councillor Calvin. Did you want to discuss further, Councillor Gottlich, or that was kind no, of... No, no, that's it in a nutshell. I think um, yeah. it's uh, the report is, I think the report is, is has taken far too long. Um, and that's that's just the reality of it. We, I was hoping to get some more movement on this, but it is, it's here now. So um, that's good. Um, and I think that, um, I think that um, the 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 survey was interesting as well, and it's given us a bit more uh, uh, information. And it was startling to, for me to realise that a lot of people didn't realise that council does not have to do this, this service, um, and that they could, if they were concerned about um, the, the cost of this service, they could go out and see if they could get a better deal. So um, that was fairly startling. Um, no, I'll leave it at that. We're, 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 it's fairly straightforward. Thank you. Put the motion then. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Make the motion are Councillor Collish, Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Connolly, Councillor Richards, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Zambrogno, Councillor Carver, Councillor Lance Bucket, Councillor Ross, Councillor Gary, Councillor Tree, Councillor Rasmussen, declare it carried. Um, next item is uh, 232. Councillor Richards. Can you move something, Mr Mayor? Yep. I've just got something here, just a moment, I'll get it up on my screen. Okay, I'd like to move an amendment to what's in the business paper as follows, that Council 1 receive a note the information provided regarding potential sites for a skate park or BMX track in Bly Park and the associated costs and funding sources to commence engagement with the community on the option of either a skate park or BMX track and its preferred location within Bly Park. Okay, do you have a second for that? Second of Councillor Tree. Um, discussion, Councillor Richards? Not necessary at this point, thank you. Okay, Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor. Sorry, Mr Mayor, I, I had my hand up from before. I was oh. just, I just thought some items were on block and they were coming up for discussion, that's all. There was okay. two emails, sorry. Oh, I see, sure, yep. Um, Okay, in which case um, I'll speak briefly to it that I, I think this is a really good report. Actually, I was really happy with the, with, with the report we've got here. It's a good analysis and done very quickly. So thank you. Um, I'd like to start, uh, I, I endorse what's in front of us. I think we need to engage with the community on the option and the location. And that's, that's something we can do without expending any great funding. So 
to get this moving along um, so that if there is grant funding or other, or other other available funding that we can actually have something where, we, where council can get to a position where we've adopted in principle what we want to do and where we want to do it uh, and, and the funding comes next. So I'm happy with that. So do you want to write a reply, Councillor Richards? Only briefly to say that uh, what's in front of us with this report and the motion tonight is what we do. That's our jobs. Our jobs is to a job is to listen to the community when they want and need something, and put it to council and test whether we've got the support of all the other councillors to do that for the community. So uh, I'd like to thank the people in Bly Park who approached many different councillors, saying that this was something that their children and their suburb needed. Thank you. Thanks. All right, put the motion then. I'll just wait for it to come off the screen. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Favour are Councillor Lance Bucket, Councillor Connolly, Councillor Cotlash, Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Richards, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Zemprogno, Councillor Carworth, Councillor Ross, Councillor Rasmussen, Councillor Gary, Councillor Tree. Very carried. Next item is 240, third party reviews. We should move something there. recommendation is that we note the information and that we start with the sports council. Moved councillor tree. Seconder. Seconded councillor Cotlash. Any discussion? Councillor Richards. Just a question. If any councillor is on these external committees, I'm not sure if that demands a interest declaration or whether it's considered part of our role. Probably up to you, but um, well, I'll make a less than significant non-pecuniary about the sports council, and I'll submit that form, Mr. Mayor. But I'll stay in the vote. Yeah. All right. We'll put that motion then, um, Deputy Mayor. Did you? Sorry. Yes, I just wanted to clarify. Um, it was the recommendation in the business paper, was it? Yes. Um, I'm just looking at that. Um, yeah, I couldn't really quite get my head around exactly what was going to be looked at. And I just wanted to put it probably in simple terms uh, to ensure that that uh, will be included. I know that some people wanted like an evaluation of whether we got our money's worth. And I think that we need to spend that sort of money on our sporting facilities. I think there's not an issue there. I think what the issue is, and this is something that I've had people approach me about since I was first elected to council in 2012. And so it's an issue of transparency around this whole sort of thing. And when I think that we look at um, different user groups who are our community, who are out there, they're paying their money weekly to play sport, they're all doing that. I think that as a council body, and I did ask for the minutes which turned up late this afternoon, so I haven't read those and there's no financial reports there, but we did get some other financial reports. I think there's some perceptions within the community about how it's operated and I would like that looked at. I think that as councillors and as the public, we should be able to see uh, tenders. I, I've not seen any tenders. We should understand why certain uh, people are doing the work. There is a perception in the community that people on the executive are being paid to do work. That needs to be, uh, there needs to be some transparency around that. That's very problematic. It's very widespread and it's been brought to my attention, you know, probably at least 100 times by different people who are sports council, uh, I guess you call them members, they're groups from, from various places. Um, I think that uh, seeking the experiences people have with Sports Council would be good. Um, if uh, we, there also seems to be, an, I would like to see the information around the grants program, which particular grants they support clubs going for, because I'm told that some people want to apply for a grant and they're told, no, you can't because somebody else wants to apply for that as well. So I'd like to know what the protocol, I want to see these protocols that exist for why these decisions are made. They don't, it, it, none of this impacts me personally. It's not a personal thing. I'm raising matters that have been brought to my, um, you know, to my attention, particularly around complaints made about it. So it's around perception. It's about um, how the money is apportioned between the different clubs 
that that are covered by the Sports Council. So the decision making around where the money is spent at this facility or another facility. And I think that it's really important. That's the sort of investigation I thought that we were heading for. And I think that's the investigation we should look at if we're looking at risk of something. I think the Sports Council does, you know, maintains the grounds and does all of that. I don't have an issue with us putting money into the Sports Council, but I think we need more transparency and accountability about how that money is spent. And I think that it's public money. It should be all publicly available. And I'd also think that we, I would like to see whatever this protocol is that is referred to in here. I don't, I don't know what that is. I've never seen it. I know it's been asked for before and I've never seen it. Thank you. I think that those things you've described are all part of what a governance um, review is, but I'll just refer that to Mr McElroy. Okay. Oh, well, I'm happy if that's what they are, but I, I, I'm, I don't know. I see all these things and they come back as different things in different guises, that's all. Mr McElroy, did you want to comment on that? Thank you. Through you, Mr Mayor. Yes, that all of those things are things that could be dealt with as part of a um, governance slash compliance type review, um, similar in scope to the reviews that have already been carried out. Okay, um, Councillor Wheeler. Thanks. Um, the, the Deputy Mayor is correct in that this, this issue is, is one of transparency and governance. And I, I think, you know, initially we asked for a governance review and I, and I think we, we then, you know, the waters were muddied when people wanted, um, wanted more than we had initially asked for. I think we perhaps um, would weren't particularly clear or clear on what we had asked. Um, but that doesn't, that, that still doesn't um, fix the fact that we haven't necessarily advanced the problems that we initially saw um, from, from those early reviews. I think we're, we're well on the way to just sorting out um, some of the issues with Peppercorn and there are some solid recommendations in there, but I've got, I've still got really serious concerns about um, the Hawkesbury River County Council and, and the Sports Council. Um, we, we, put, we put councillors on these organisations as delegates of council and we, and we send significant amounts of money to these organisations with the idea that they will perform particular tasks for us. I feel a I don't feel like we get a sufficient feedback um, after we send those delegates in. Um, and in one case, those delegates are, are, are paid for the work that they do. Um, we don't get any reports back. We, we don't, I know that the, um, the Hawkes River County Council um, has a legislative requirement to provide its minutes, but we don't get the minutes from the Sports Council. We didn't until we specifically asked for them. And then we had to ask again for the next batch. They need to be sent through to councillors and placed in the hub as a matter of routine, not because we've asked for them. It's not good enough that we have to go hunting for this information when we are asked to sign off every year on those financial contributions. It is we are not able to perform our fiduciary responsibilities as elected representatives if we don't have the information about how that money is spent and there are no reports that ever come back to us. Those council delegates need to send through the minutes and they need to report to council at least every six months so that we know what we're sending them into, what parameters they need to function within as delegates to those organisations, whether we're getting value for money and what is being done with our facilities um, what the, the, those third parties are required to manage. Um, we, I've got real concerns about the security and storage of equipment and consumables by the Hawkesbury River County Council after that theft um, and finding that all the, um, all the herbicides washed away into the river because they were flood affected. Um, we haven't resolved the issue of the Hawkesbury River County Council. I'm still not convinced that's our best weed management model um, and so so I'm I feel like I'm still sitting here having said for several years now that I'm not comfortable with the implications of us sending money into these organizations and simply not hearing anything back 
from the councillors that we send in with them. This is a process issue. This isn't a criticism of those councillors. This is a criticism of the process that we use. Our other committees um, where we have the chair and councillor representatives are reported back to council um, following each meeting. And, and I've taken my responsibilities as chair of the Heritage Advisory Committee quite seriously and attempted to, to deliver a report with each time those minutes come back. Um, and Councillor Reynolds and Councillor Zampronio have assisted me with that. But in this instance, we have people who go away to these third parties and nothing comes back to us. And yet, yet we don't spend any money on the Heritage Advisory Committee, and yet we spend tens of thousands of dollars on these other organisations. We expect them to manage our resources, and we don't hear anything from them unless we specifically ask. That's not good enough. Thank you. Councillor Ross? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Peppercorn is um, well on the way to um, sorting things out. It's the terms of delegation matter that should have been resolved that hasn't been. That needs sorting. Um, if we're to look uh, at all business like in the face of what other government departments are. Uh, who, who are providing funds and are expecting services uh, uh, to um, have acquittals based on a, a proper understanding of things. Um, Hawkesbury River County Council, um, despite its known faults, has um, certainly pulled its shoes and straps up uh, in the recent um, period. So that there is a um, a, a level of response and ongoing uh, improvement there, which I, um, I think is for the benefit. Um, what, one might question what they're doing and how they're using their money, <clears throat> but at least um, there's a level of reporting now and access to information <clears throat> that was not previously the case. However, um, the um, most significant <clears throat> item is in regard to Hawkesbury Sports Council. Um, the governance officer has been good enough to provide information in the latter part of this afternoon. I put together a very hasty reply just prior to this meeting, which I think everyone's received. Um, I, I would summarise that as being as follows. The, the information provided um, council by its um, legal representative on this occasion, or one of them, um, was based on a set of informational questions, which um, I, I believe did not fully uh, elaborate the um, conduct and, and uh, actions of Hawkesbury Sports Council. And in so doing, uh, I've pointed in my email tonight to some deficiencies in the um, uh, elements of the legislation which have not been considered. Now, I've, I've put it to the governance officer that the lack of consideration of those elements and uh, the uh, suitability, shall we say, of this um, so-called protocol um, re revolves around the legislative items that have not been addressed and require addressing. Um, I believe that that should, frankly, be the first step so that there is a clear understanding by everybody um, of what the, what the situation is in full knowledge of the facts. And I, I think if um, my colleagues would um, care to read that, and I, I hope the government's officer will as well, um, I, I, I think there may be a different uh, light thrown on things. 
Um, the, the statements made by my colleagues are correct because I've had, um, what, nearly five years of involvement in um, the matter of uh, non-compliance of lighting of the sport fields. And uh, I've seen a lot of documents. I've also seen uh, uh, minutes of meetings, which uh, other people probably haven't. And um, there is a great opportunity there for um, more economic operation of um, our sporting activities and support thereof, uh, but under a different model. And I believe that um, it is now at a moment where this council is in a situation that more has to be done with less. Thanks, Councillor Austin. Time has expired there. Uh, Councillor Tree. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I um, just wanted to ask a question. Because it's a delegated authority to the Sports Council, uh, what are the legal requirements that they have to actually report anything back to Council? Do we know that? Um, that's part of the point of the review, I guess, but I'll throw that question to Mr. McElroy. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there aren't any provisions in the legislation that require a um, particular kind of reporting. In, in relation to those sorts of um, organisations to which authority is delegated generally. Um, there, I mean, council has processes in place in relation to how it sets its budget and allocates funds, but there are no specific um, reporting requirements or provisions around how information is provided back um, to this body. So in actual fact, what's happening is actually not um, irregular or a singular event unusual in any way because we've actually essentially just said we don't want to deal with this we're going to give it to somebody else to deal with that's that's what the effect of the delegation is so that council um has another organization i mean in this case the sports council that um is delegated by the council to provide functions that the council itself would otherwise provide um it, and so it's it's not not necessarily un, unusual, um, as you say. However, the question is whether or not there should be um, an expectation about information being provided back for the benefit of of the council that's providing the funds. So that's I don't have, don't express a view on that. It's just that it's, it's an issue. Yeah, but it's an issue because it's been made one. But I think. Um, in general terms, when we give a delegated authority, we just expect the people, the body to be able to do the job that we've, you know, given them the delegation to do. Um, look, I'm happy to support a, um, a review into this because obviously there are a number of people who are a bit upset about it. Um, but I do find it interesting that we have some councillors who are happy to cast dispersions about um, people who are involved in sports council uh, regarding possibly making money doing work for them. Um, but they actually fell over themselves trying to support um, heritage advisors to get onto a panel who actually get paid by us as the council um, to do work for them. So I just think that's another little bit of example of a hypocrisy. Point, point, of, point of order, Mr Mayor. No, don't worry about your point of order, you silly woman. Uh, that's, uh, that's, no, that'll be another point of order, Mr definitely, Mayor. Definitely out of order. Yeah. Um, okay, just stop talking there, please, Councillor Tree. Um, Councillor Reynolds. Sorry, I'm just trying to stop laughing. Um, regarding delegated authority, when we pay like millions of dollars to to um, these organisations to do work on behalf of us, are, are their finances audited at all? I, I, that's a question I assume to um, Mr McElroy or perhaps Emma. So, Mr McElroy, is the Sports Council audited? Oh, geez, the CFO wants to answer that too, I think. It's through you, Mr. Mayor, perhaps a question for the Chief Financial Officer. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the sports council accounts get audited by the sports council auditors, so they engage their own auditors, and then their accounts are consolidated into our accounts. Thanks, Mr. So, Mayor. I'm so, sorry, sorry, Emma, I didn't catch that last bit. You broke up. Their accounts are... Sorry, so, their, so the sports council accounts are audited by an auditor engaged by the sports council, but their accounts are consolidated into council's accounts. So there is another opportunity there um, for our auditors to, to pick anything up as well if they wanted to. Okay, so so council council laws don't actually see the audited reports unless unless we go looking for them. Is that right? No, no. We we, we actually ask for them before they get their final payment. So that's uh, that's part of the conditions that um, they have to provide them to us. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right of reply was for Councillor Kotlash. I believe. Is that right? Yep, no, not required. All right. We'll put the motion then. Thank you. Not required. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Find yeah. the new All right. We'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. In favour are Councillor Connolly, Councillor Richards. Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Tree, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Lance Bucket, Councillor Zamprogno, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Rasmus, and Councillor Garrow declare it carried. And um, our next item is 243, notice of motion uh, two. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Yes. You didn't call for oh, those sorry. who oppose the. Okay. I've got a good idea, but against. Councillor Ross, declare it carried. Sorry about that. Um, Notice of motion to Councillor Ross, you want to move that? Well, th thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. We'll seek a seconder. Yes, we'll move that way. Seconded, Councillor Reynolds. Discussion, okay. Councillor Ross. Thank you very much, and thank you to the seconder. The, the reason I've raised this um, is. Uh, in a sense, fortuitous, because we've had already quite a deal of debate, and what it has shown is that um, there are particular difficulties that are being experienced in that locale, uh, and the um, incidence of those is, um, I, I would uh, put it to um, my colleagues, increasing and has increased in uh, the recent month and months. Um, as I indicated to the council briefing session, uh, two, two recent uh, rain events um, ca caused the uh, existing structure to be overtopped. I estimate at about 400 mil. Uh, at which point I don't know whether it was a maximum or, or not. It could have gone higher. And um, that led me to question what has basically been a PR campaign in, in regard to uh, the, the latter part of which has, has been um, uh, s s some representation of, of a s structure that is uh, allegedly in the final design stages. Now, as I understand it, that structure um, is, is to be uh, built with a um, traffic uh, lane of approximately one metre elevation above the existing tra traffic lane on the Timber Bridge. Uh, that sounds fine uh, in one respect, <clears throat> but no doubt the beams that are supporting the new structure when it's in situ will take up a degree of the one metre and um, it's unclear at what point the uh, new structure would be closed as a viable transport option in the case of um, a rain event. Um, I also note that uh, in my <clears throat> um, submission this evening that uh, 
<clears throat> I am calling for what I, I would believe would be a reasonable uh, uh, degree of um, flood immunity at one in 10. Um, the the uh, staff report furiously refused to uh, discuss what the uh, impact of a, a one in 10 bridge would be on, on the structure. We've got one in fives, one in twenties, but not the one in 10. Uh, I, I, I uh, sincerely believe that a, a one in 10 is not immodest. It's not excessive. Um, and we're looking at a structure which is a, um, a substantial expense. It could be 10 to 12 million, I don't know, with, with all uh, the other ancillary uh, elements thrown in. This is a total project cost, I'd, I'd estimate. Uh, and it's going to be there for another 100 years. Now, we don't know what um, the situation is. Uh, we can't foresee that to that degree into the future, but there has to be a structure there that is um, physically able to withstand that uh, longevity, but it also has to be serviceable. Now, <laughs> I, I question the um, interpretation that uh, raising the height of the uh, structure by one metre uh, was done on a scientific basis or, or a, a, um, a, 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 an acceptable engineering basis. I, I, I believe that there needs, uh, and, and uh, I'm hoping that the introduction of Public Works Advisory uh, is more than just uh, uh, in regard to uh, procurement. If it was to be a little more rigorous in its uh, um, uh, addition to this uh, project, I think that would be warranted. And I think that that would provide um, both a degree of um, greater confidence to the community and ultimately to the elected body here, which finally is going to have to sign off on the project and this sort of money, uh, regardless of uh, whether there's funding or no funding, it has to be done. Uh, the, the, the other complication that is uh, oh, obviously the time, time, time has expired. I'll let it go on a bit longer, but it's definitely expired. Thank you. The, the other complication in, in this so, um, project. Sorry, sorry Councillor Rush, you need to stop speaking. Um, my, my, my sort of input here would be that um, whilst I understand this has come from a, uh, a very good place, I don't want to do anything here that's going to delay this project, um, such as stipulating a new design uh, or asking for this to come back in, in, a, in a new way. I think. This is very well advanced. Um, some of this, I think, is quite reasonable, like asking for projected key dates, which I think we already have, um, but we, we need to get that clarified. Um, you know, I think we've dealt with some of um, the things in point E in our earlier item, but I'm certainly not in favour of dictating to the staff what they should be doing in terms of designing a bridge, which is, I don't think, the job of the elected council. Um, so I wouldn't support it. Um, Councillor Ross, you've got your hand up. That is residual. Uh, you have entered into argument, which which I'd be pre quite prepared to rebut. You do have that right of reply, yes, if there is no other speakers, um, which there aren't, so you can have right of reply, Councillor Ross. Thank you. Um, the significance of this project is, is, is the monetary cost and its efficacy in, in doing the job which the community and, and we would expect. Now, the, the element to which I had not been able to address through the debate was the difference in um, elevation between Upper Colo Road and the bridge deck. It is quite considerable. Now, um, there is comment in the management Sorry. report. Councillor Ross. Right of reply should be directed to debating any items that are brought up during debate. So 
Uh, I spoke for about 30 seconds, so any of the things that I raised in that 30 seconds, you could rebut in reply, but not, thank, not able thank to you. information. Okay. I honestly uh, and sincerely believe on behalf of the community, as a community representative, that uh, just plucking a, a design out of midair like that, as it would appear, is inappropriate. It needs to be peer reviewed and uh, based on, on uh, the best available science and understanding of the environment in which the structure is to be put. And uh, if, if the, this council does not do that, um, there is a great degree of risk involved. Thank you. Thank you. We'll put the motion. Um, all those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand. In favour are Councillor Ross, Councillor Reynolds, against. Councillor Connolly, Councillor Lyons Bucket, Councillor Zemprogno, Councillor Kotlash, Councillor Wheeler, Councillor Calvert, Councillor Tree, Councillor Richards, Councillor Rasmussen, Councillor Gower, I didn't record your vote. Before or against? So do you want to just tell me because I'm not sure what you're trying to indicate? Sorry, I was full. Four. four. Okay, Councillor Gower, recorded as four, declare it uh, lost. Um, that was our final item, I believe, um, for this evening. Um, so thank you very much, Councillors. It's been a a very interesting term and it's finished very differently to how we all saw it starting. So uh, appreciate having the chance to work with you all and um, we'll see what happens at the election and some of us will be back, no doubt. Thank you, everybody. Declare the meeting closed at 10.46. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Pat. Bye, Tiff.